Okay, I just let everybody disappear below the table. As the cameras go down, it's because they broke the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Janet's not here, but just like Janet's flooding the views. Yeah. It's just she's <laughs> coming. <laughs> no. Oh, she's not here. Yeah. Trending. Working. Pardon me? I thought they were we can do this. Three to two. Oh, I don't think so now. Oh, okay. That was one potential. Oh, okay. yeah. I'd like to call the meeting to order. And before we go into anything, I'd just like to say that we are now live streaming. This is the first time we've been up and running. So there may be some glitches here and that, but uh, we'll work it out as, uh, as we go forward from here. Okay, motion that the agenda for the April 24, 2018 Committee of the Whole meeting be adopted as presented. So we'll move. Motion and Chouinard, all in favor? Passed. Uh, motion that the committee meeting of 27, 2018 Committee of the Whole be a meeting adopted as presented. Councilor Byer, all in favor? That is passed. Okay, at this time we're supposed to have a delegation here, but they are now presenting at the Yellowhead County. So they will be coming over here after Yellowhead County. And we'll just, uh, wherever we're at, we'll just stop and then be the next one on the list here now. Okay, Corporate Services, 2018 Operating Budget, Staff Report. Sarah. Um, if I can make a, a suggestion, if we could maybe discuss the 2017 operating surplus first before we go into the budget discussions for 18, because it may have some impact on um, dis discussions okay. that you have. That's fine. So with the 2017 year closing, um, the town showed an uh, increase to our unrestricted surplus of 1.8 million. So that's the uh, operating surplus for 2017. Um, so a number of factors have, have come into this. Um, back in 15, we passed strategic priorities, which helped um, the administration focus their spending on, uh, on the priorities that council had set. And also in 16, we brought in a purchasing policy, which again, just streamlined those uh, purchases that we would make. So. Uh, do you have any questions on the memo that I have there? Are there any questions, Councilor Byer? Um, I do. Um, so if, if you uh, scroll further down to it on page three, it talks about the operations budget, uh, that line painting and patching um, wasn't completed. Was this, uh, sorry, to the administration, or to the Treasury administration, was this from um, a, an inf like a decrease in service or an, in an efficiency found, or what, um, what, what can you explain to the line painting? I can defer that to <laughs> Mr. Derricott. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, th those were two projects that um, I, I think a combination of um, a, a late start to the spring and not in inability to you know nail down a contractor in the appropriate season, um, and, and we weren't able to to bring in a contractor to accomplish it as we normally would. So, uh, yeah, but it's it's uh, our intention to continue with those programs. It just didn't fall together last season the way we would have liked. Okay. Um, it, it's actually good news that we have a $1.8 million surplus, but I mean, a lot of stuff, was that due to the cost savings or what was the main driver? I, have, I can just do a quick um, summary of the uh, okay. attachment I had there. Um, sort of main things that led to it were the RCMP contract actually came in under 250000 so that was a savings there for us. Um, our fines netted out to about 133,000 um, surplus on the fines. Um, under the bylaw, we have uh, we always budget for full uh, complement of staff, and we didn't have two full-time staff in bylaw for a, 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 a lot of the year, so that was a savings there. Um, our snow removal, we had a lot less snow at the end of the year. Um, we usually budget around uh, 300,000 for a, any given year for snow removal. 
Um, there was obviously less snow, but we also had a lot of efficiencies were found um, by doing a lot of more things in house rather than contracting out. So we actually saved a lot of money in, in snow removal there. Uh, and the line painting and patching, as was mentioned. Um, every year we also set up an amount to go towards the landfill reclamation, the money we need to put aside when our landfill is, is used up to reclaim that land. And the liability had enough in, it, in there, so we didn't have to put that money to that liability in 2017. And uh, there's a master servicing plan that has been um, ongoing through engineering. And uh, we had the uh, amount budgeted in 17. They only completed about half of it, so we saved on that, um, the rest of that for 17 as well. So they could have made up a, um, a bulk of the, of the surplus that we have. Um, and then it's just the, uh, those efficiencies that we brought in. Um, every department seemed to come in under their budgets. So uh, that was led to that as well. I guess I'd like to say that line painting is what we do in town. It's not on the highways and that. It's what we do around town and that we're going to continue on to do. And that, so there's here. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for the update, uh, um, Sarah. Um, I guess a, a couple questions. Um, obviously, policing is a, is a huge part of our budget, and some years we are uh, hit with some pretty heavy uh, uh, bills through the contract. Other years, as we see this, this past year, it's, it's under. Um, what do we do with, uh, with the uh, excess funds out of protective services? Do we set that aside in a reserve fund? Uh, to pay for overages in future years or any public safety initiatives so say if council endeavored to put pedestrian crossing lights would we have a fund set aside for that that would be the discussion that um, council would have on what to do with that that 1.8 um, obviously our reserves are always <laughs> welcome for to have the, those monies put into them um, but it's really up, up to council to decide how to um, put those funds and usually they would just flow through to that surplus I then bring that back as I did with the other one that we were looking at earlier uh, and then you would decide how you'd like to allocate those funds or use those funds Go ahead. Um, yeah so from my point of view I'd like us to like if we do have um, some savings or some extra revenue coming out of our uh, photo radar or fines I'd like to see that stay within the protective services portfolio or public safety um, that's just uh, that's just my point of view but I I'm going through here and I see a lot of uh, different areas with which uh, had some cost savings, which I, I think is, is absolutely excellent. And I think uh, uh, the previous council uh, who set the strategic priorities uh, along with their CAO deserve all the credit for uh, making this possible. Um, that's a huge amount of money and, and I think it serves our tax base uh, very, very well. So uh, thank you very much. And I also concur with the mayor that if we're able to put something away for maybe traffic lights or some kind of uh, walk lights or whatever in that, if we're able to help us offset that because it can be a big cost if we're going to do it ourselves. If we're not going to get any help from the province, then we've got to definitely look at it because we are getting more and more on the thing that uh, to Council Chouinard is for us. Since we're bringing up traffic lights, I still stand by that the province, it's their highway and they should be paying, but I do agree if they don't, it's for the safety of the public. Traffic lights are very important in this town. If I, if I may add, Mr. Yeah. Chair, um, we do have in the budget what we call a public safety initiative reserve that we have started. Uh, I believe it was funded about $100,000 in this, in this budget, and so that's um, funded from those fine revenues to do the address projects such as the ones you're describing so that process is already in place but it could like um, Sarah suggested it can always be augmented or or added to at the discretion of council as well there's there yeah just further to Councillor Schnard's point I agree the province needs to pay but uh, if we could come to the table maybe they'd be more willing to, to come to the table as well so I just like us to start planning for that um, I think we all agree that um, the safety on the highway is probably everybody's top priority around this table and uh, we got to get moving one way or the other to, to address that, so. Agreed. Any other <coughs> question? Oh, Council Barr? I have one more question through the Sheriff's Administration. Um, you guys have addressed uh, uh, most of the um, uh, differences. Um, is there an explanation for the recreation and culture uh, difference of 355,000? Uh, when we're looking at the overs and unders, we look at percentages. And around 10% is, a, is a, a fairly normal, you can sort of sort of go either way, 10% without it being too um, much of an issue. 
Um, so looking at recreation, they were 10% under, so I didn't really investigate that fully because that's within the, those parameters. I, I think it would be safe to say that there's not an item that yeah, contributed yeah. to that. It was a number of different savings um, that uh, were a part of that process. But. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay, Sarah, I guess we'll go back up to 2018. Okay, so we'll look at the um, operating budget. Uh, this is just um, some changes from what was uh, presented in December. Um, I've listed some of those uh, minor changes in the memo there. Uh, just to address the, uh, the curbside pickup increase in expense, that was due to when we bought, it, bought the first budget, we were doing a different mixture of organics versus household pickups. Um, we've since refined that and changed that a little bit, and it, it, it in increased the uh, expenses slightly there. Uh, but at this time, we're not looking at um, raising the rates that are being charged to um, the users. Um, just moving down, the municipal servicing plan, that was reducing that budget because we had made that expenditure in 17, um, so I didn't need the full amount in um, 18. And then... Because we had that reduction, I'm suggesting, just it's a suggestion, <laughs> that uh, we can move 95 of that into the, one of those reserves that we, we took out because we were trying to get to that 0% in 17. Mm -hmm. So we removed a reserve. Putting that 95 back in would actually start replenishing that reserve. Uh, so that was just one suggestion that is in this budget that I've presented. Um, yeah, so now I'll go on to the, and talk about the requisitions. Um, in, the, in the budget that was presented in uh, last year, we didn't know the requisitions for the schools or for Evergreens. Um, they come in earlier in the year, as, as does our assessment. So um, these are amounts that are, are set, uh, given to us that we must pay other organisations. Um, you don't set the mill, well, you set the mill rate, but it, it's actually one that comes, the, it has to match the amount that they send us. So council doesn't really have any say on that amount of money that gets sent to the province for schools or to Evergreens for the seniors. Um, there's also a new requisition that came in, um, the designated industrial property requisition. Um, that to ended up being only about $2,200, but that also goes on to those uh, properties that are now being assessed under that, um, that new designated industrial property contract that was signed. Uh, one other thing that is different as far as the seniors requisition goes is every year for the past few years I've uh, been collecting about 272000 every year towards capital um, projects uh, just to build up that reserve so that the capital projects could have come in, in swings and roundabouts. So rather than having a, a, a large requisition in one year for our taxpayers, we've kind of steadied it and just get the same amount each year and put it in a reserve. So. Um, just looking at what we've been paying for the capital lately, I've actually just raised that to 300 and suggesting we keep it at that going into the future just to make sure we have enough in that reserve for those future capital projects that come down the line. Uh, so down in the actual um, attached sheet there for the summary, you can see on the side those differences that I've talked about in the memo. Um, and that difference in taxes is just we historically have always had a two decimal place combined mill rate, and I, I'm, um, I cannot change the requisition mill rate, so I just slightly adjust the municipal one to get down to that, which is why there's that extra $6,000 there. And this has been presented with the 2.9% that we had talked about um, last year. Questions? Uh, Sorensen? Through the chair, uh, this recommendation <coughs> for a $300,000 uh, capital requisition, or, um, is that just for uh, the seniors or just for ca uh, Evergreens or is it in general capital? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Sorensen, it is just for Evergreens capital. There's a number of municipalities in, in Evergreens and uh, we all share in all the costs for every community. So. Um, our share of the, uh, it's done on an assessment based share, I think our share is around 7.1%. So when any capital projects come up in any of those communities, we pay that percentage towards that. They also help pay ours, so it's, uh, it's helping that out. It's just in, the, in the past we've had the capital requisitions come in and we've had to put the mill rates up very high and it's been a bit of a hit to the taxpayer on, on those requisitions. 
So we came up with this, just doing the same amount each year towards capital. Dr. Chouinard? Um, if I'm through the chair, if I'm looking at this, so uh, it's minus, what is our total under budget? So we budgeted so much money and then we got minus uh, figures here. So we're, how much dollars different? Like where you got minus between right? between the budget yes. in, in here. <laughs> yes, the, uh, from what we budgeted in December and to now's date, because it's about it's actually a decrease of about thirty three thousand. Okay, that's what I mean. So I guess I would compliment the we gave you the budget. Uh, good job estimating. Uh, I still feel strongly a lot of times coming to January, February, the the unknowns where the other ones is. So uh, I'd have to say good job estimating because we did pass it to administration and administration obviously figured the prices out right because if we're that close, because if we would have been the other way, the mill rate would have been affected. So I have to compliment you, good job. Any other questions? I guess I have a question, Sarah. On this uh, uh, beautification and that, it was sitting at 50,000, you're decreasing by five. Is that because it wasn't all used up? Because I know at one time we said we'd go 50 and if it wasn't gonna be used, we would think about taking it away completely. Yeah. That's one of the things that um, I thought we might talk about when I, I'm going to bring that 1.8 surplus back to have a, a, a okay. more in-depth discussion. Um, last year they actually used the whole 50,000 yeah. for their beautification and the reserve dipped down below 50,000 for this year. So I've just brought that down so that the reserve is covering, that the amount that we're spending is, co is covered by the reserve. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Dr. Larson. I noticed that later on today we're talking about the West Area Structure Plan. Does that need a that need funding within our operating budget? Just to I'll, I'll defer that to yeah, Mr. Yeah, Thank you. No, that's uh, in included in the existing budget as presented. Council Byer. Uh, through the chair to administration. Um, so with the new um, uh, designated industrial properties that uh, has changed with the province, have we notified those? Um, taxpayers uh, of that change? I can do that. We haven't as of yet, but we are intending to send a letter to them to let them know that that will be on their, um, on their tax notices when they receive them um, in the middle of May. I may add to that. I, I believe also that the province is doing some notification directly to those properties that are affected. So um, we'll, we'll do it as part of our mm -hmm. tax notice process, but um, they really that responsibility now belongs with the province and, and my understanding is they will also be doing some direct notification, so. Thank you. Thank you, and one more question through the chair to administration is, um, on the expenses, uh, the professional services that were um, uh, under by 116,000, can you remind me what uh, that entails? Oh, that is for the, uh, sorry, through the chair to Councillor <laughs> Byer. That is the, um, the master servicing plan at the time of the budget, there hadn't been any invoices received, so I moved the entire amount of that project over to the 18 budget. Mm -hmm. From that time, we received a lot of invoices in, okay. so I was able to drop that down by that 116,000 okay. for the 18's budget. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, okay, let's move on to- Just, just, to, just to ensure councils, uh, um, on the same picture, uh, the intention would be to bring this budget then forward to next week's meeting um, to be finalized and passed. Um, we really don't have any more track here because the mill rates also <coughs> must be set at our, at our mm -hmm. next meeting. So um, I this is kind of the time if council wants to see any changes or any adjustments, I obviously we'd be happy to go with what's presented, but I just want to make sure council is <coughs> aware that um, that's the uh, intended process uh, for for the budget yeah, and I believe for the councillors that aren't here right now if they have any questions they can uh, get a hold of yourself or Sarah and that and absolutely you can yeah. answer them and bring them up to speed on that mm -hmm. okay. Councilor just a clarification we passed the budget at the end of the year so yeah. this is just for information because we, we passed the final budget so I don't understand what we're passing we already passed the budget Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, uh, as was discussed there in the fall, there's always a finalization process of adding requisitions and other information that we don't have in the fall. Um, and then uh, at any time, council can amend or adjust their budget. And so we're just asking for council to make the minor adjustments presented here along with finalizing the, the mill rates with now the known requisitions. Okay. 
Okay, seeing none here, let's go to the 2018 revised capital budget and reserves. So the revised capital budget presented here just has three changes from the one that we presented to you last year. Um, the entrance side had a remainder of 15,000. We wanted to do some landscaping around those signs, uh, so I've moved that difference over to the, to the 18 budget. Um, the well exploration, we had it at, every year we do about uh, 318,000 as a, as a rule to just continue with our well exploration. Um, there was an amount left over from the 2017 wells budget that uh, engineering has requested uh, council consider um, adding on to 2018's uh, budget. And uh, also with park trails, we had uh, initially 80,000. Uh, we usually have about 200,000 every year we put towards trails. Um, this uh, money, the difference here is actually monies from last year that wasn't spent, um, and they've already been allocated through MSI for trails. So we're requesting that council consider um, increasing that budget for 2018. Mayor Chair. Okay, so I have a few questions <coughs> through the chair. Um, so my first question uh, through to administration is what work will be done on the park trails uh, in, in 2018? What, what will that money be used towards? Uh, yeah, th so there's a couple of items in, um, I, I think also this is what I would say parks and trails, uh, not just specifically trails. We uh, intend to uh, complete the Hillendale Phase 2 park with uh, the fencing around the park would be part of the project. Um, we also, um, plan to do some work out at Vision Park that would be associated with that. Um, there's the trail signage. Um, if you remember from the trail master plan, there was some extensive work on um, wayfinding and, and that's, a, I think, a, a pretty uh, significant, uh, I if there was any deficiency in our, our really exceptional trail system, it's that it's not that well signed. And so um, we intend to implement the, um, the signage as per the trail master plan. And then there's a few um, I think extensions of a few minor pieces of trail. Um, you may, on the east end, they're connecting um, uh, uh, Hillendale right there by 40th Street and a few other, um, uh, I think, minor works such as that. But I don't know if Jim, is Jim here? Jim, do you have anything to add to that, if I may? Right, we're also investigating ways to uh, finish the 63rd Street um, section to connect with um, 13th Ave. We're all also looking at a uh, potential street side connector uh, on 13th Ave to connect with the existing sidewalk mid east of 63rd Street. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're looking at ways to finish that loop off and uh, potentially run a section up 40th Street to Bear Lake Road to uh, keep people off the road, those people that run and, and bike and uh, want to continue that loop along Bear Lake Road to 63rd Street. Okay, thank you uh, very much for that. Um, just looking at the um, uh, spreadsheet here on operating reserves, I did notice that uh, under the public safety initiative, uh, we have an opening balance of 74,000. However, it doesn't carry over to a closing balance. I don't know if that's just a, a typo or is that money being moved somewhere? Um, and the other question is, uh, what is uh, what does the administration see as uh, the ideal amount to have in in operating reserves, I know we're at a 2.7 million by the end of end of this fiscal year. Yeah, if I may, I, I think um, we had. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. there, Sarah. Sure. Combined the public safety initiative into the protective services, um, uh, so that there's just the. We didn't want to have 50 different reserves, and so I think the public uh, safety initiative now is just as encapsulated under the protective services okay. reserve. So I, I think that's the answer to the first question. Um, it, it, answering the second question, uh, I don't think there is a, a set amount because some of it can be project-based. Um, uh, there's a few items that I think are important that we have some reserves set aside. For example, um, it's just reasonable probably to have uh, anywhere from fifty to $100,000 in a legal contingency and, and things of that nature. Um, 
but uh, at, at any given time, I think this is a number we just review and um, if, if we ever felt like this uh, money was, uh, if the reserves were too great, we can always reallocate it either to capital or, or to other projects. Um, and, and or if other projects come up and we need to increase it, I, I think it just kind of needs to be addressed as a, uh, as a going concern. But Sarah, do you have anything to no, add to that? That's fine. Yeah. Council Schumard. Okay, through to the chair. Um, under the heading roads in uh, transportation and street rehab, those numbers are down now. Is that figure included? Like, of course, we did water and sewer on up on 49th Street and other ones. Have we already budgeted in to get those streets done, or is that part of that? Sorry, which, which, which part? Uh, of the right on, okay, on page um, four or five the heading roads and transportation 2017 street rehabilitation or rehab uh, 583,000 and bridge and culverts so I'm noticing in there is we would ongoingly redo some streets and water and sewer lines or um, as we're upgrading but those mounts aren't in there like we seem to have backed off on doing them okay, on, the, on the capital project page yes sorry okay. on capital okay, that's yeah. fine um, this year for uh, the street rehab uh, we only <coughs> budgeting I believe to pay for the work that was done last year. Okay. We're trying to um, do a different initiative where we're saving up our grant money for two years and doing a much bigger project every two years uh, rather than trying to sort of do, do these little projects every year. So for this year we're only doing the paving of what we did last year and the Bridges and Culverts always has about 200000 in there right, to, right. Do, to do some of that work every year. But then when we drop to the water and sewer of course we have the big ticket is the um, water treatment plant, but in ongoing, so what our plan is every two years we'll do water and sewer because our age of our town, we have always, every year do so many sewer lines and water lines. So uh, now our change of plan, we'll do it every two years. Is that why the numbers are down? That's my understanding. Gen generally speaking, yes. I, I also think we are um, anticipating the uh, rollout of the asset mm -hmm. management plan, which will greatly assist in evaluating um, the priorities for, for projects and. Um, it's not just water and wastewater. There's obviously a number of yeah. capital needs for the municipality, and then we will be able to um, evaluate those. Uh, uh, on the trajectory we were going on, doing a significant four or five million dollar street rehab project every year just wasn't sustainable financially. Our reserves have basically um, run out in terms of the infrastructure reserve is now under a million dollars, and so it just wasn't sustainable to do that size of project every year. And so to do it every other year becomes a lot more manageable financially. But Respond. Yeah. Gosh, huh? Well, what we're looking at the $1.8 million surplus. So a lot of times then, I mean, w because we know we spend three to $4 million every year, so we're doing big projects. So some of that stuff should be set aside because we have no choice. We have old water and sewer lines and that's why been for many years we do so much every year. So I'm just sort of looking at these figures that that may be a way to put it. So if our plan is every two years, that makes sense to me. Then we'll spend and tackle bigger, bigger projects. S certainly an administration will be looking to guidance from council as to how to allocate the $1.8 million surplus. That's part of the bringing it forward. Um, I think the, the, uh, there's a, a number of uh, things that we need to be aware of. One, one of which is um, we don't have a, a detailed report here. Um, but the wastewater treatment plant is going to require, I think, at least uh, some additional funding. Um, and AECOM, the engineering firm who's managing that project, will be coming to council and making a detailed report. Um, and so there will be some funding requirements, uh, I think, associated with that. Um, you'll see later on the agenda, there's some requests from co some community groups. Um, and um, that $1.8 million can get allocated uh, pr pretty quickly. And, and I think those are all obviously important and worthwhile projects. But um, I think it's just a... Um, S uh, allocating the additional funding there won't <laughs> won't be a problem. There's always, I think, more projects and more needs than there is uh, resources. Councilor Sorensen. Mm. Well, uh, uh, unlike uh, Councilor Chouinard, I'm not uh, particularly happy with the 1.8 million surplus. Uh, I don't believe nonprofits should have it. It's larger than as a surplus, um, and I have a tough time asking taxpayers to increase their taxes this year when we had a surplus of that much from last year. So um, I'd like to see some of that at least used to reduce the increase for, for 2018. Councilor Blyer, I think Councilor Minister here. 
Uh, my question uh, through the Church Administration is regarding in the capital reserves, um, the parks equipment pool and then public works equipment pool. Um, can you explain those lines a little bit? Um, I'm, I'm just not following um, how that uh, works out and, and what it um, is exactly for. Okay. Um, a little while back I, I brought um, some of the unrestricted surplus to council to be reallocated and at that time was instructed to um, start a parks equipment pool so that the parks department have their own equipment pool. Anything in the green on that particular on that sheet is coming from that, is being reallocated from that unrestricted. Uh, so we created a new um, reserve for them, putting 300,000 in there. Um, the public works equipment pool, uh, we also thought that they should have 300,000, so we bumped it up so that both of those now have 300,000 in them. Um, and uh, along with Councillor Thompson, um, you know, I, I think that it's it's really great that we have a surplus and that uh, all the changes that have been made to to get us that far. Um, I, I would certainly like to see us tighten up our budgets um, to not have this large of a surplus in the future. Um, uh, but I uh, do understand that uh, it's it, it can be challenging to uh, increase your taxes one year and then not the next year and then maybe the next year. Um, consistency on that, I think. I think if I just may add to that as well, um, certainly I think for context as well, this uh, I think is encouraging in terms of financial performance because tax uh, has gone down. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we've taxed additionally to create this efficiency. This is efficiencies that have been generated, I, I think, through uh, prudent man management. And I have to give a lot of credit to our managers who have really, really, uh, I think, adjusted their philosophies there. Um, and, and so also for context, I think that um, um, $1.8 million on a 20 plus million dollar budget is only about 5%, which is, I, I think, not uh, egregious in terms of, of that. Um, and, and so um, I, I certainly have no issue with consideration for you know uh, taxation as, as part of a allocation for that. Um, I think we just also want to be mindful of the fact that we um, have a significant infrastructure deficit and so we would honestly we're just lying to ourselves if we reduce taxes um, is, is my administrative uh, uh, position to uh, town council I'd much rather see that money allocated to address some of those deficiencies without having to impact the taxpayers more and I think we should be thrilled with that that possibility if we can use that money to address some of our capital needs um, which are fairly significant um, we also are at a stage where we anticipate um, uh, the development of a multiplex uh, um, facility, which I think will carry with it you know, some operational costs that we don't currently have. Uh, and then we may find ourselves soon in a situation where we're just now um, playing catch up there as well. Uh, and so those are just, uh, I think, important pieces for town council to, to consider there as they, they evaluate that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, I concur that um, I, I would like to see at least a little bit of this um, used to buffer um, the increase uh, on taxes. Uh, just for the fact that we do have some utility increases that are going to be coming this year, it'd be nice to uh, allow our, um, our residents a little bit more uh, breathing room. Um, I also uh, agree with the administration that when we get our multiplex up and running, there's going to be, uh, I would anticipate some increased operating costs and we need to be prepared for that. We need to start planning for that. And I know we've had some discussions about uh, slowly increasing our rates at, at Repsol Place uh, to, to get ourselves in a little bit better posi position that way. Um, one concern that I do have though, um, further to Councillor uh, Chouinard's point is uh, we've recently had a discussion about um, the uh, sloughing of the bank by the RCMP detachment. Where in this budget is the money allocated for uh, that particular project? Um, so yeah, the original intention was that this would be covered under that bridges and culverts portion, about two hundred thousand dollars. We recognize that um, uh, we're unsure at this point what the total cost will be. 
Um, it's our anticipation that we would be requesting that uh, council fund that from a reserve at, at that time. So we do anticipate that there will be a requirement for additional funding there. Um, we just didn't uh, reflect it in this. We certainly very easily could reflect it in there. At this point, it would be just an educated guess on what that, that would be. And so we thought in terms of process, it would be just as worthwhile to wait until we actually knew the cost and come back to council and request a, a specific amount. But if it's council's preference, we can certainly request mm -hmm. or uh, reflect an estimated amount in, in that budget. It just may then require some adjustment when we get the final pricing back. But um, I, I administration would be happy to do that if, if that was something council wanted to see. I, th I think it's fine the way it is. Uh, I'd hate to put a number in there and then all of a sudden that, that, that's, the that was our project, only. So. Okay. Yeah. So we know that number is not going to be sufficient. We just don't know what okay. the number will be. Dr. Schnard and Dr. Sorensen. Yeah, just to comment on the surveys, I'd have to add, uh, agree with our um, CAO is exactly, this has been something that we've been planning for several years. We know if we're gonna move forward to some major expenses. So where we've asked over the years, tighten up the budget. So yes, it looks like it's a surplus, but I totally agree in time to come is we know the unknowns. Uh, we're gonna have to make payments on this building and maintain it. So it wasn't something that just happened overnight. It's been long-term planning. We've been uh, working towards ma doing a major expense to improve the town. So right now it looks like something that money can be used up very quickly on a lot of our projects we have in town that have to be addressed that we had no choice not do them. So it's something we work towards and like uh, I totally agree if we'd be putting a major tax increase in, in place, but we're not, we're keeping a reasonable one. It just proves to the public that yes, if we move forward and we build the building, that we are responsible, we can pay for it. So virtually good job over the last few years and I'm pleased that it came out this way. It's something we've been planning for for some time to make it happen. If, if, I, if I may, just following up on the conversation, if there was a, some adjustment to uh, the taxation currently at 2.9, may council give some feedback as to what they may like to see there so that uh, administration could consider addressing that? Are we talking the council would like to see it addressed by uh, down to a 1.9 increase, down to two, um, and, and then we can obviously follow that dynamic through. Uh, Councilor Sorensen. I, I was Ford. up next. So there's one more thing I'd like to just discuss before we get into that. Uh, my understanding is that we uh, we were gonna we're gonna kind of we're gonna approve a revised budget on Tuesday. Um, can I just see a one-page uh, summary of what where all the one 1.8 is gonna go? Uh, I'm sorry if it's in here and I can't find it. We, right we, it has not it's been allocated. Not so council so will not. be giving us that direction and up to and including, you know, uh, like I said, supplementing. Uh, taxation or reducing the tax burden is okay, one of the well, options to be considered. So right now, the 1.8 million is firmly councils to allocate as you see appropriate. Okay, so can I request that on Tuesday we have a one-pager that just clearly tells me where it's all going? Right now it's going... I agree, I agree. So you would have to tell us what would yeah, be on so that one-pager. Today we're probably going to give you some ideas. That's right. And yeah. then so that you summarize it for okay. me. Yeah, no, happy, happy to do that. Council Bar. Um, so uh, through the chair to administration, so my um, comments regarding the uh, 2.9 tax increase is that um, I would prefer to keep it the same so we can, over year by year, be more consistent and, as you mentioned, um, continue allocating for the, um, the asset management that we know is going to be coming forward and uh, we know that th being in a town uh, of this age that we have infrastructure problems and I would prefer to keep a consistent tax rate rather than have a low end this year and the next year have it adjust again. Um, but my comments with that is that if we can have a, a budget that is a little tighter, um, like, and I commend you for the effort that you've done, um, but I'd prefer this time next year to not be having another $1.8 million. I would rather have it something a little bit closer um, that's a little more manageable. So that's sort of my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, and, and certainly um, I, I think part of the reason we've experienced this is because um, we've tightened up on the spending side, but if you tighten up the budgets before you tighten up the spending, then it doesn't go so good. <laughs> um, so, but I do think we have the opportunity now to continue that process of, of drawing that. Um, I share the opinion. It's certainly not our objective to have a $1.8 million surplus. I think it's preferable to the alternative, obviously. Um, but um, I, I would much prefer to see this as, you know, around maybe half a million dollars or, or that type of um, a, a process so um, that's administration's objective is to to be in that area um, and, and what I think we find now is 
we we may have some opportunities to just allocate that money like i said to either project based mm -hmm. uh, opportunities or to strengthen our reserves and our financial position um, and, and or even to transfer some of it to our capital needs which is always a pressure that that we feel so um, we're obviously feeling very pleased to have some flexibility to to address that um, I, I just also may want to add this is uh, quite rough and you can correct me if i'm wrong sarah but um, a one percent adjustment to the budget is roughly just over a hundred thousand dollars so to to um, to reduce say this year's tax rate by one percent would mean that uh, approximately a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars of that 1.8 million dollars would be used for for that purpose so that's just so Council can have some numbers while they're thinking about that as well. Councillor Schnarr, Minister Harrodin, Councillor Sorensen. I was questioning it before, but now we're talking surplus. Do we have allocated amounts we need to solve the problem in Tiffin with low water pressure? Do we have a figure on what's that going to cost? Because the 1.8, we need to address that. So that can part of it can be used. It's a problem carryover. Yeah, we don't. Uh, th thank you, if I may. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, no, we don't have a specific amount, but yes, that is one project that will need to be funded in the very near future. Yes, that's, that's potential for sure. Okay. Or doesn't matter. Okay. Mr. Chair, go ahead. Um, yeah. So uh, my my thoughts on the 1.8 million um, is that we do set aside maybe uh, 200, 250 thousand dollars. Uh, into our protective services portfolio to start planning for uh, contributing to some pedestrian crossing lights on the highway. Um, I would not want to spend that money until we get a commitment from the province that they're also going to be kicking in um, some money. Um, I think that Councillor Shannar brings up a good point. We are going to have some expense uh, to deal with the Tiffin issue, uh, which, um, which we haven't got an update on yet. So I think uh, we need to anticipate that. Um, I also, uh, I think returning or lessening our tax burden by $100,000 uh, by decreasing or increase from one or from 2.9 to 1.9, I don't think is um, significant on, on a number side uh, when you're looking at a $1.8 million surplus. So um, I would like to see that uh, reduced down to 1.9, um, giving basically $125,000 back to taxpayers uh, to help out uh, understanding that they are also going to see some fee increases this year uh, that will be coming down the pipe to help pay for things such as that wastewater treatment plant. So, um, other uh, um, the other portions I think just need to go into reserve for for future um, consideration and projects. So, Councilor uh, Sorensen. Well, uh, uh, I'm glad to hear community services um, um, comments on 13,000. I would like to see our tax uh, increase this year around the 2% number. It's in line with uh, Alberta's inflation number, so I think that's a great uh, benchmark for us to aim for every year, is the inflation rate. Uh, everyone I just see to be justifiable. Um, yeah, those are my two uh, if I may, uh, would, would, would this council be supportive of us bringing this back with a 1.9 percent tax rate is that something that this group would want to see we we, uh, we just need to know before we leave this meeting because she has to do the actual calculations and so it's it's difficult to do that on the fly obviously so um, would council generally support that uh, that position uh, yes I would be in support of like say I don't like that but I mean um, I agree what we're echoing there is fee increases and there's other increases so I guess we can uh, go into the public saying that you know tightening up our our budgets um, you know uh, going 1.9 instead of 2.9 would be something it's not a big deal but it is something to say thank you everyone's involved because when we tighten up budgets some of the services get cut so some people may complain that you know we've tightened that services aren't at par but that's their re reward and the 1.8 um, we all know sitting in this room that a large part of this is something we're working on will disappear you know and it's a major project that we have to that we are going to discuss and we're not opening it to public so I agree let's go 1.9 would be a re rewarding not a re reward but telling the public due to our tightening up some of the services here's some cost savings back to you if I may I think I would add uh, I, I 
am very supportive of Councilor Sorensen's perspective. Administratively, we take the position that inflation is generally our target for budgeting, and, and so um, it, just in recollection that the 2.9 percent was in uh, partly in reflection of catching up on the zero percent budget. The 1.8 million dollars obviously indicates that we've. I would suggest we've caught up. So um, uh, it certainly can be done without any impact to service levels to make that type of adjustment. So um, I, I, I don't. I think that's enough feedback for us on that point. Unless yep. council has anything to add, Sarah, are you, no, you you're good. clear on that? I'll uh, yeah. bring it back on Tuesday at 1.9 with the mill rate bylaw for passing. Yeah, you have food ask question. Council Buyer, yes, um, to the chair of trade administration. So my own, um, you know, my, my comments are then that yeah, last year there was a zero, a zero tax increase, and in order to keep up with inflation on the infrastructure projects that um, we aren't necessarily doing this year because our, we want to, you know, use our MSI next year for bit larger projects that we don't want to fall behind on on that type of um, mm -hmm. inflation is, is where my concern is. But I can um, agree with Councillor Sorensen that um, over the years aiming for that inflation index would be uh, the most reasonable. Uh, method going forward, you know, with the information we have now. Yeah, uh, thank you. And that is our philosophy administratively is to target inflation. I get just a comment to that. I guess in our last council last year, and that we knew that when we went to a zero percent increase, that it would maybe be a little bit of a more increase coming this year. And that but we did give our our ratepayers a uh, a little bit of relief by not having any taxes, and that and they really appreciate that. And now we have the surplus, and if we can. Bring it down to 1.9, 2.0. I'm definitely in favor of that. So you know we're 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 being more fiscally responsible here in that. Now the other question I have is uh, most of them were asked already, but on this park it says Kinsman Park playground resurfacing. Is that the whole thing, or is that just where the gravel and the grass were where the kids were running? Is that the whole park itself? Yeah. That, uh, Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that, that is speaking specifically of the surface underneath the play structure at Kinsman Park. Um, and uh, I actually think uh, Community Services intends to bring a report back uh, talking about that park um, because after some additional investigation, they actually, I think, have some alternative options they want Council to consider. They still want to make that investment in the park, but they want Council to consider um, what that will look like. But um, in this regard, yes, it is speaking to that kind of, the intention was a poured rubber surface there, but you'll see in the very near future, um, community services making a presentation to council, asking uh, for consideration of some alternative options there. So like that also includes the gravel part that wasn't done just off to the right hand side, the south side, I guess it was, there was a lot of gravel there. The kids were running out on the gravel and grass and that, so that would include fixing that up too. Uh, this, this, this was specifically to underneath the play just structure, but I think place. you're talking about the, the little drive to where the pumps are and that type of thing. There's just yeah, a little just gravel the structure there. Yeah, there was gravel and we had talked at one uh, time. I, I think, uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's an option just because we have to have equipment drive on there. And if you go to okay. grass, it just becomes kind of messy. And, and okay. so it, there is a purpose for, for yeah, that we, little I remember we talked about it and some residents asked about it. And that, we can definitely consider options there. Maybe look at something like that. Potentially, yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to F4, community service, potential projects for financial support. Morning, Mr. Chair, Councillors, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we have representatives here from the Edison Cycling Society, as well as from the Yellowhead Agricultural Society. As you've noticed from my, uh, my memo this morning, uh, administration was asked to follow up with reports mm -hmm. and presentations that had previously been done by the two groups that are here and to look at potential funding options for council to consider. Um, just to summarize uh, my memo, uh, the Yellowhead Ag Society uh, is in the process of sourcing funds to build their riding facility. Um, they are asking the town uh, for a $393,450 donation, which would be uh, a matching name sponsor for that facility. The Edson Cycling Association, of course, is in the midst of constructing a bike skills park in Wilmore. And that project uh, will be beginning this summer um, it's a multi-phase project 
And they uh, came to us, they came to you uh, a short while ago asking for funding as well. Um, and for that project, there are essentially three options. Uh, one at 62,000, uh, the second one at 150,000, and the third one, which would be an all-in, finish the project, uh, sum of $358,054. Are there any questions with respect to the memo? Any questions from Councilor Schnard? Okay, so what we're doing is we're coming back and asking for the two projects. I was trying to find the um, amount. So the Yellowhead Ag Society, is that a lump sum? Because it says naming. So what they're requesting is a lump sum from, from us. Is that correct? Correct. So if you go to their presentation, yeah. you, you'll see the, uh, the financials where they've broken yep. down their budget and they're asking uh, Yellowhead County for a, a certain percentage and also asking for the town of Edson for a certain percentage. And uh, I believe that is based on, on population or on That was on users. Okay. The, the amount of users of town users and county mm -hmm. users. We had our, uh, she broke it down as to what percentage is town and what percentage is county. That's how the numbers come from. Okay. Because it's also two part because I'm also bearing in mind the request for the cycling because I mean both of them are adding to our community so on the cycling I believe there was three different amounts so it's 6200 and then there was the total but I correct so an, an all-in figure so if they wanted to complete the entire project for the summer uh, the amount would be about three hundred and fifty odd thousand dollars and that's inclusive of, of uh, donated time from the cycling association I'm correct as well as uh, materials and and volunteer hours and uh, fairly large price reduction because they don't have to mobilize as much equipment to get it all done in one shot as opposed to over a number of years so if I may I have one more part to this okay go ahead uh, with the amount so I guess we're looking at the Yellowhead Egg Society a we have to find out is this a go do they have all the financing because I'm not against helping them out uh, it's just a matter of dollar-wise, same as the cycling thing. Both projects add to our, our community, sure. uh, you know, bringing more people, the, you know, making use for Wilmore Park with the cycling and the ag improving a building, which there is a demand. It's like when you go through their whole presentation, they're not just pinpointing. It's a broad <coughs> spectrum of, of a lot of things that can happen out there. So I guess that's the question I'm asking. Do, are they going ahead? I believe the project is about eight million dollars total project. Is that correct? Mm. That's completely finished. Yeah, mm. everything. Yeah. So, um, are we allowed to speak? Or not? Go ahead. Okay. So we actually broke ours, and it's been broken into phases. So last time we spoke with you, the RFPs had just gone out. We hadn't awarded them to a contract company yet, and so now we have. They've been it's been awarded to um, Elite Holdings from Whitecourt, and so he has actually broken it down into phases for us. So. The first phase that will have our um, building complete, usable, rentable, bringing in income um, has been, um, he's brought it down to $3.9 million. So um, that is what we're focused on right now. That will have the building complete, it'll have washrooms in the building, it'll just have a few of the things like foyers, like nice to have things, won't be in phase one. Um, and so we will probably do phase two in two years is our plan. Yes, and then I guess uh, s same thing to the cycling. You guys are obviously moving uh, forward, so you don't have a big financial, which doesn't make you any less important, but I like the numbers that are lower, and it added, you get a lot of don donations. So as long as your projects go to, for myself to consider the money going forward, are the projects going ahead, which cycling, I guess, is already running. They are Jay Hoots is booked for July, beginning of July, and we have 150 grand towards that, right? Correct, okay. Uh, that all-in all cost is Jay doing everything not, without any other volunteer work. Okay. So we can bring that down then. Okay, thank you. Councilor Sorensen and Councilor Barr. Uh, I'm in full support of both of these uh, projects. I can't um, pick a favorite. Um, I, I think both are going to be uh, incredible economic stimulus for our community. I'm really excited about both of their opportunities to bring in tourists and new events and uh, yeah so I'd like to see a similar number donated to both of them or contributed to both of them um, 
I'm thinking in the 300 to 350 range. So that would be that would be my comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Byer. Uh, through the charge administration. Um, so can you um, give us information on what the, uh, like I understand that the uh, matching name sponsorship agreement for the Egg Society, um, how that works, I understand that part, but what, what does that mean? Um, does that put our name on some type of uh, part of the building or like our, yeah, I, I noticed, you know, if the county also contributes, uh, you know, we don't have information, but like would we, would there be some type of setup like that? Like I believe it's already called the Chrysler building. I think what I can do is defer that to the, the Egg Society for for comment on what that actually does for the town of Edson as far as the naming rights. Yes, we do have um, many naming right opportunities at that time. And so for amount like that, we have different areas. Um, we have in our facility, we have uh, a warm up arena, which is like an 80 by 130 area. And then we have the actual arena where you'll see all the major events happening. So naming um, a naming of that amount, of course, would be then have their name on the um, warm up arena as well as on the um, main arena. Um, we will have also, like many facilities do, we'll have our thank you wall, which it will be on there, um, and on our big sign as you come into the, um, as you come into our ag grounds that are already there. Go ahead. Uh, and to follow up with that, I do echo uh, Councillor Sorensen's uh, view on this. Um, uh, both of them had excellent presentations. Um, it was quite obvious that they, uh, have the community support behind them through their donation and the different volunteer groups that have helped them, um, especially noted in the um, uh, the cycling club. Uh, the work there is not easy. Uh, it's quite back back breaking um, effort. So and they've had many different groups over the years to assist with that. Um, uh, both projects would help different demographics in our community. It would give people something to do, um, and additionally help uh, the tourism in our community as well. And uh, with the surplus that we have right now, I don't know if. Uh, going forward, we can always commit to these types of projects, but at this at this point in time, I would be in favor of the the uh, option three, the three hundred fifty eight thousand for the bike park and uh, the amounts uh, in the matching sponsorship uh, for the Ag Society as well. Is it here? Yes, um, I think that both uh, both groups, as as was said earlier, have done a an, um, just an amazing job. Of, uh, of work uh, behind these projects. Uh, I'm very familiar with the work that the Cycling Association has done. I think that um, the Bike Skills Park, the plan is amazing. I think it's going to be a huge draw to our community. I think Wilmore Park is our hidden gem that a lot of people within our own community don't even realize what's out there. And I think this is only going to enhance that. And I, I think we might have some, some issues down the road, five, ten years from from uh, uh, perspective of not having enough camping spaces out there because I think it will be a draw and I think that um, it's really become a, a really central community hub. So I'm in full support of, of the full amount. I think we'll find some cost savings by doing it all at once and um, any additional <coughs> funds that are left over I think could be put towards some of the uh, other work that's going to be done out there. Um, I know I see uh, Dr. Odendahl out there every week seems like uh, busting trails and uh, uh, all the other volunteers, so I'm um, in full support of that. Um, the Egg Society had their entire board here. Uh, all their volunteers, the uh, chambers were packed uh, a few weeks ago, and I'm really excited about that project uh, because it's not just about um, egg. There's a whole bunch of other projects that will, or events that will be happening there, um, and uh, we know uh, through their presentation that uh, some events have left our community because the current facility is too small. And they are interested in coming back, and I, I, I agree with Councillor Sorensen that it will actually create some economic opportunities for our community as well. So uh, we have the financial capability right now to support both of these projects, and I'd be in full support uh, uh, for the amounts uh, indicated here. Uh, and I, I think they're really great things for our community, and, and will really benefit families and, and youth in our community as well. So. Yeah, if I may, then the administration will, will bring back uh, some funding recommendations for mm -hmm. these projects for next council meeting for consideration. Yes. Okay. Sounds like the feedback. Okay, good. Thank you. And I guess my remarks too is that I, I, I have to agree also with this and that, that uh, I know that the bike trails out there too and that uh, uh, my grandkids are always going up to, to Hinton to go on air trails, but now you guys are getting them out there. They're staying in here to get their friends to go out there. They're loading the stuff in the back of the trucks and they're going out to Wilmore and that. And it's a plus, and I know the parents like it. I, I've been out there, I've seen lots of people walking out there. They like it, 
I can't wait till it's finished, you know. You, uh, it's just, uh, and I know in the past we have talked about doing something with the camping out there. And that uh, last council said, you know, we gotta do something with the camping, make it a little bigger so the bigger motor homes and trailers can come in there, pull throughs, whatever and that. And uh, also I think one of the biggest thing we have to look at there is parking. We're really, really uh, lacking on parking on out there and that. And uh, just see what goes on out there in the winter time but uh, Deanna and the uh, crew out there puts on, it is packed out there, so we have to really look at that, and it's only going to get worse when we go ahead with this. I do support both projects. It was excellent presentations we have in that, and uh, it's a big value to our town here in that. Uh, Mr. Chair, just to, to re respond to your questions, uh, this summer we will be increasing the size of the parking lot in the lower area, and we'll be working on that. And uh, last summer we completed a project uh, to increase the size of most of the campsites, refurbish them with uh, new grills, fire pits, gravel. Uh, we're constantly uh, looking after uh, trees that are potential hazards. Uh, there's, uh, the parks crew did a tremendous job last season and will continue to do so this season to improve the quality of the experience down there. Okay, just a little one last follow-up or ask question. So if the, and this is to the Ag Society, if you get our funding, your project is a go phase one? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so your phase one's ready to go because I'm also in, in favor of it. It's uh, filled the void. So phase one's a go. I totally agree with the rest of my council that we should support this. It's going to be added benefit to our, our town and surrounding areas, town and county. So if it's go, I'm in favor as well as the bike. It's something is to help improve Wilmore Park. So I'm in favor of both projects as well. We do have the finances to help. Why not help out these both projects are very valuable to our community. Any more questions on that? No. Mr. Chair, I just I, I see that our delegation, delegation is here. here so okay, I, think I think we'll, we'll just interrupt right now and get our delegation in. Well we're interrupting. We turn up the heat on freezing. Oh, oh god, I'm freezing. Oh, that's perfect, you know. Yeah, but you guys are bundled up. <laughs> you guys are welcome to stay if you'd like. If not, we understand. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thanks, guys. Uh-oh. There's actually a spare table beside the front. <laughs> no, no, she's a sticker. She has a in trouble. She's under control. Better point than Jennifer. This will be your, Mr. Chair, this is our youth council. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, are we ready? Well, today we have a delegation from the Community Engagement Action Team, and I'd like to thank you guys for coming to do a presentation us. Can I get you to introduce yourselves to us, please? Um, I'm Nick Smith. I'm a student here in town at Parkland, Composite. I'm Lainey Beachy, and I'm a student at uh, Pine Grove Middle School. And I'm Jenna Beeler. I'm a student at Parkland. Oh, thank you. Uh, before we go any further, I'll just get council to introduce themselves to you here around the table. So, Councilor Gene Chenard, well, welcome to our council chambers. I'm Troy Sorensen. Uh, Crystal Meyer. Mayor Kevin Zahara, welcome. Trevor Bevan, Councilor, and also Deputy Mayor. So thank you very much for showing up. We look forward to hearing your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, and thank you for including us on the agenda today. Um, we are here on behalf of the youth working with the Community Engagement Action Team. So we, along with a few other students, worked with CEAT members to review the results of the committee's community safety surveys. And basically what we found was the community members' main concerns were drug use in the community and feeling safe around town. Um, our surveys also showed that there are people, programs, and places in town that are working well. And they help create a sense of safety for the youth in town. We also found that youth are looking for a free or a low cost thing to do off the street so that they aren't having to put out $20 just to 
keep themselves busy for the afternoon. At one point, we had talked about what the community can do to help improve safety. And we found education about drug use was a really important tool that we haven't really taken out of our bag yet. Um, <clears throat> most people um, indicated that they do not consider our community to be very safe but that could be improved by having a safe place to go and be active and connect with positive adult role models. Um, as a group, we decided that one simple step we could take to improve safety in our community would be to work with adults from the committee along with other community members to clean up the spray park and other playgrounds. We are meeting on Thursday, May 3rd at 3.45 p.m. in the hospitality room at the Repsol place to fan out and clean up used needles in the areas where little kids play. We invite all members of council to support us by joining us on Thursday, or if you can't join us, by telling everyone that you know about this innovative and letting them know that youth in our community are making a positive contribution to improving community safety. Thank you for listening this morning. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Any questions? There's your hair. Uh, first of all, great presentation. Thank you for uh, for being here today. I know it's a little nerve wracking, probably sitting over there. So, um, so really appreciate that. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to some youth that are currently on probation uh, here a few weeks ago, and they echo a lot of the things that that you highlighted in your presentation. So, what kind of activities or spaces would you like to see in our community? Of course, we're our council is talking about a multi-use facility, and I think. Some of your input is really valuable as we plan for that in the future. Um, well, I think that everybody, we've been talking a lot about like um, maybe like building an arcade or something because that's been a big thing. Because um, when most kids are getting into trouble or doing things that they're not supposed to, they're kind of bored. So if there's something for them to be able to go and do that low cost that it could prevent those types of things from happening. So uh, space, arcade, pool, tables, that sort of thing. Council Blair? Uh, through the chair to our delegation, uh, great job. And it's def I know it can definitely be scary sitting on that side of the table, but we don't bite, we're too far. So um, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, uh, so when you're talking about the free drop in sports or activities, um, are, are you thinking something that's more centrally based or something that would be in each neighborhood that, you know, would be a few blocks from your house or, or one location that everybody would be able to gather to? We had only really thought something uh, centrally based beforehand, but what you're mentioning there kind of intrigues me in a sense. Like that would be rather interesting to see a drop in say basketball or road hockey or something organized actually set up that would be yeah, positive for sure yeah no I okay Councilor Zark. uh through the chair thank you uh ladies and gentlemen for your presentation you, you guys they weren't nervous you did a great job now have you considered a lot of times like the one comment cost free have you considered volunteering and how i mean like this you as youth may have a project instead of building a building like you're, you're saying road hockey year-round sports now as a group uh you know because our in our community volunteer uh, volunteers is dropping and i'm all about the youth getting involved so if you guys could as yourself you know have a project that you'd want to put forward and your group of youth could volunteer to make it happen any ideas on something that you'd want that not like building a big building a million dollars, but something that's practical and like you you had said, low cost to you. Personally, I can't think of any individual ideas, but like I had just mentioned over that way, um, road hockey and basketball, and those are all very low cost sports that can be organized. and. If something were like like that were to be organized and set up, I would personally would definitely volunteer. That's something I would want to see happen. 
Right. Because what I've seen in other towns, a lot of the youths, like yourself, and I'm all about it, they come up with the project. Like as the youths, they come up with the project and they ask for funding and they did volunteering. So a lot of times to keep the youths, you know, because I agree, you're bored, what do you do? But if you get the youths involved organizing, helping volunteer with a lot of clubs and or organizations, yes, you can look at it different. You don't have to hit all the meetings, but that would give you something to do. It doesn't cost you anything, but it gives something back to our, our actual community, like our what used to be called Rotary Sundays in the park. You know, there's um, other groups that are going to bring back slow pitch and the other ones. So if you get the youth involved helping, that would give you a project cost-free to you and it would help your town. So just sort of throwing it out there, there would be something that you could get involved with, with your your town to help it. Mr. Sorensen. Uh, through the chair, um, great presentation guys. Um, I like the, I love the fact that you guys uh, you did the survey and you, um, it wasn't just your opinion, you went out into the community and uh, sought out some data to back up uh, these um, recommendations. And I also like the fact that uh, you pointed out things that are working and not just the things that need fixing, so uh, good job on that. I would echo some of the comments here tonight. I, I would strongly support a youth uh, clubhouse or uh, area that they can meet in the new multiplex and a uh, safe area um, for kids to hang out uh, all day long. You know, I do support it, Nat. You know, uh, I do sit with the the seat group every now and then when I can make it in that, I've made quite a few of them. And last time we had a presentation and, and there was kind of the, the adults kind of done a presentation for you and that, it was nice to hear from them. But it's nice to hear from you guys because you have a different uh, perspective on it than that. What you guys really want or you need or whatever and that. And uh, we get to hear from the adults all the time but we don't get to hear from the youth and that. Eh? And it's really great. And, and I think we have, you know, places in town that we could probably do something with um, I think more like uh, down by the Griffiths Park there with the Boys and Girls Club there that uh, the rink has to be redone in that so we're going to knock it down and redo it let's resurface it, hard surface it we could put uh, some more tennis courts in there or some more basketball we could put a roller thing in there if you want to play roller hockey in there in the summertime for whatever and that and it could be a, another drop in place for you know our teams to go down there and stuff like that too and, you know so I, I think you know we're all on the same page that we want our youth to be engaged in whatever we move forward on here in the multiplex you know whether we can incorporate it in there or we can put it in a, another part of the town to help uh, you know revitalize that part of it and that and I I know the youth nowadays they they get out and they walk you know they will go to uh, to different places and that and I think you know you guys being with seat I really like it because uh, um, you guys can give them their opinion too. They can come to us anytime, and you guys can also get a hold of us. You know, just if you have a question or anything like that, please get a hold of council or administration. And uh, you know, by all means, come back again, sit down. Uh, and I know the one thing you guys asked last time at the seat was, you know, like a, a pool hall style where you could, you know, drop in and play some pool. There was a lot of discussion on that, and I've heard other. You start there saying, "Yeah, it'd be kind of nice to be able to drop in." Unfortunately, we went from three pool halls way back when down to zero, and now the only pool is played is in the Legion, for example. And that, and unfortunately, they don't let anybody in after seven o'clock. But you know, maybe it's something to talk to them that maybe we could, uh, you guys could put on a tournament throughout the daytime on a Saturday or whatever, and that, and, and use that facility because it's not used 100 percent either. And that, and that's just maybe that's something like that, you know. And also, you know, get involved with the Boys and Girls Club too, you know, go down and talk to them about what they got on their agenda coming up in Youth International Week here and uh, putting teams in and stuff like this and that. So, you know, uh, great job. I hope to see you guys back at our table again mm -hmm. and that. And any any other questions from you guys that you would like to see? Before we're dismissed, um, we're, we should mention the needle drive thing that we're doing where we go and actually clean up where we're meeting May 3rd at 3.45 in the hospitality room at Repsol Place Right. for that. Um, I was wondering if we could get a going or not going from like board members here. You'd like some counselors to come out and participate yeah, I was with you in that. Yeah, wondering like, which all of you guys would actually be willing to drop in a RSVP essentially at the moment, you know, or whatever right, at, right now to say that you will be there, like a confirmation and know who all is actually going to show up. So 
I, I guess when you say the Eagle Drive is, can you explain what it is? Because uh, probably people don't um, know maybe well, what it is. We'll be going and we'll be fanning out and cleaning the areas of town with our CMP involved and others after we meet at that location. And we'll be going out and fanning and trying to clean up all the used needles and keeping a total number and dropping off with the RCMP that's with us and just trying to clean up our at-risk areas like that so no four-year-old or someone stumbles along and ends up having drug paraphernalia and discovering it and asking them questions about it or maybe even actually accidentally poking themselves on it, the worst case scenario. Well, I know I'd definitely be interested in helping you out. I'd have to check my schedule. I think like everybody else here does, uh, we're, we get fairly busy here, but I think the rest of the council, if, you know, if they're able to, I, I believe they would probably show up. So, Councillor Schnard. Uh, I would say the same thing. I mean, I do work full time, so I would like to, uh, my concern is, I'm glad you mentioned the RCMP, you're going to do a needle drive, make sure you have the proper precautions, need, you know, be educated on it, because the last thing I want you guys to do is go out with a good deed and someone get injured. So I like your incentive, it makes sense to me. Um, obviously, if you have the RCMP, that means it'll involve other people, so it's picked up in a safe manner. Yes. Uh, and as far as May 3rd, I gotta check my schedule. I like it. I don't wanna promise I'm gonna be there. All I can tell you, if my schedule's free, I will give up some of my time, but no guarantee. I have a very busy schedule, but all the power to you, but be safe. Mayor Sahara, then Council Byer. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to attend. Uh, just my schedule doesn't allow it, but I certainly support what you guys are doing. and. Uh, I will tell people about what's going on because I think uh, you guys are giving back, you're volunteering uh, back into the community. Um, and we talked about, uh, just briefly here, about youth engagement. And one of the things that we're talking about is setting up a Mayor's Council on youth um, to help advise us on, on some issues. I'm just wondering if you guys would have any interest in, in sitting on that uh, council to provide input on some of the decisions that we're making. Oh, 100% I would be willing to okay. step forward to do that. Excellent. That's good to hear. Okay, thank you. If I just want to administratively, we'll certainly be happy to um, make it possible for some staff to attend and support the initiative as well. So uh, we'll make sure the town is represented there. Council Byer. Okay, uh, through the chair to the delegation. Um, so are you just cleaning up the used needles or is it like a garbage kind of spring cleanup as well? I don't see any reason why I wouldn't pick up a garbage wrapper if I'm already walking there looking for something else. <laughs> but the initial drive is to get drug paraphernalia and things like that off of the street. Okay, and like I've got two young kids, so that's why I'm, I'm asking. Um, and I certainly feel it's important for them <coughs> at a young age to understand that um, if somebody else throws some trash out, that uh, it's our responsibility to, all of our responsibility to uh, clean that up. Um, I, I don't know my schedule 100%. Uh, right now it looks free, but I'll have to look on my calendar at home. But if I uh, don't have anything going on, I will be there. <coughs> Councilor Sorensen. Uh, great initiative. I love the fact that you guys are taking uh, taking the drive and doing this. Uh, it's a great issue, and uh, you got my full support. I'll try very hard to do that. I guess on that note, too, that uh, since the RCMP will be involved in that, you'll probably be given a uh, heads up on what you should be, how you should pick it up, how you should dispose of it, and uh, um, <coughs> types of gloves being handed out or anything, or you, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, I don't know 100% the full details, but it'll most likely either be that or the actual direct RCMP officer themselves would be picking up yes. anything that is actually threatening to your health. <coughs> okay, that's great. Is there anything else? Do you guys have any other questions at all? And like I say, anytime you want uh, want us to know something, please get a hold of us. Get a hold of our administration. They'll send it out to, to us. Uh, the seat group back here too. Uh, they'll keep in contact with us and that. And we're definitely interested in working with you. It's uh, We haven't done it in the past very much or not at all. So now we have a, <coughs> excuse me, a chance to do it here. And we wanna make sure we keep you guys involved in whatever's going on with the youth in the town. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming out and doing the presentation. Very well done. I look forward to seeing you back at the table again. So thank you very much. And uh, feel free to send me a message on Facebook or Twitter as well. I know that's a good way to engage. So. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, John. Thank, thank you, you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome to stick around if you'd like. But uh, 
It's a chance to skip school if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, a resource officer didn't like that. Great job. Okay, moving on. Where are we at? The uh, 2017 YAS activity listing for council? Mm, no, we're past that. We're done. F5. Oh, F5. Sorry about that. Public Works, next. Waste Management, Bylaw Refill, and Replace. <coughs> there. I'm, excuse me, Mr. Chair. That one I'm not sure of, but the next two items I will declare a conflict because it's possible like that. So the next two items I will leave the room for because it may or may not be. So I'll, I'm going to go on caution. <laughs> no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. So a quorum? That's just a committee. <laughs> but okay. If it was a council, we'd be, uh, we still have, so yes. Go ahead, Darren. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Obviously, I'm just looking for some direction. Uh, so obviously, um, in anticipation of the new waste program and the organics program, we had to rewrite the bylaw to reflect all the changes in our processes. So uh, the intent will be to go to council on May 1st to basically do first, second, third reading. So we're just looking if there's anything polishing or any comments that uh, council has in regards to the, to the new bylaw and any changes that they might want to see in the uh, polished uh, bylaw that's brought to council at that time. Mayor Zahir. Okay, so um, lots of information in this bylaw through the chair. Um, I guess I, I had a look at at this and uh, most of it I don't have much issue with but when I'm looking at um, section 6 general um, you know I do have some concerns that um, uh, for example under B no person person so shall set out solid waste at the collection point prior to 7 p.m. on the night before the assigned collection date uh, no person shall fail to set out solid waste in the appropriate waste container at the collection point prior to 7 a.m. on the assigned collection date. Um, I don't see that to be necessary, and I, I'm concerned because um, we have a number of individuals in our community that work shift work, um, work out of town, where they may actually have to put out their garbage a couple days in advance, um, and I don't, I don't see why we would need to be that restrictive uh, on the rules. Uh, especially um, I know that in some neighborhoods we have some neighbor issues and I would hate for um, a neighbor to put out their garbage only to have a neighbor who's upset with them to call bylaw and them getting a ticket for something so silly as putting the garbage out maybe a few hours early um, I, I just think it's way too uh, too restrictive in, in that regard and uh, if we're not if we're not prepared to enforce it then I don't think it should be in our bylaw Your worship through the chair. Go ahead. Uh, I think the, the general intent is so that uh, it, they follow that basic collection schedule, so you're not putting out two to three days in advance, or it's just it's more so this is a guideline that was found in just about all of the bylaws that we had researched back with similar programs as ours, and that was just why we had, had left it into there. If, if I may add to that, I think to um, I, I think mention all those items is more important in terms of if there's an issue, it gives us the ability to deal with it. If you're silent on it, it becomes enforcement. Then is really challenging and, and really difficult. Um, and, and so, uh, I, I don't think this means that we're going to be driving the streets at seven, <coughs> six thirty at night. You know, um, looking to see if anyone put their garbage out too soon. I, I, I don't think that's the intention here. Um, but uh, I, I think it does give us the ability to 
uh, address potential issues that that it, that exist there. So I think we can be sensitive to that direction, uh, but maintaining some of those parameters might be helpful uh, in the future as well. So, Councilor Sorens first. Yeah, um, I would echo the Mayor Zahara's comments, uh, especially on the second one. Um, no one is required to put out their container. They they can do it every. You know, they, they don't have garbage, they don't have to put it out. So I'm, I'm going to fail C all the time because they don't have very much. So. Yeah, I think that's more about if you put it out at 930, you may miss your collection. And so that's just trying to, I think, clarify that point. But certainly yeah, if you don't. That could be said a yeah, lot better. Yeah, actually. and that's fine. Yeah, no, I, th I just tried to express the, I think, the intent of that piece. But. And some wording change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just further to administration's comments, I, I certainly understand that we would be around uh, doing waste patrols, uh, <laughs> handing out tickets. Uh, I'm more concerned that uh, if we have it in a bylaw and we have some, as we know, we have some neighbor issues in a couple areas of our community, that if it's in our bylaw, they make a complaint and it's really a frivolous complaint, but if it's in our bylaw and we don't lay a charge or to issue a ticket, then it comes back yeah. to us as, well, we're not enforcing our own bylaws, so why are we, we having it in there? Um, I think maybe some wording changes would make this a little bit more uh, reasonable. Um, as mentioned, you know, uh, it says in here, no person shall allow waste container to remain on the collection point after 9 p.m. on the assigned collection date. Once again, people are away for a day or two. Uh, you have a neighbor that just want, wants to create some problems. Um, I, I just don't see that to be necessary. You can't. You cannot uh, legislate common sense. Um, you know, I, I would much rather see something that would say, uh, you know, uh, residents must uh, remove their waste container uh, within a reasonable time, uh, within 72 hours or, or something like that, just to make it a little bit more flexible while still giving you that enforcement tool. So if you do have somebody that just chooses to leave their garbage container out there week after week after week, then you actually have some some enforcement mechanisms. Yeah, no, I think we can definitely reflect yeah. that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Councilor Uh So uh, through the Chair of Administration, so in reflection of uh, both Councilor Sorensen and Mayor Zahara's comments, um, I have kind of the same concern. Um, I know the 6B, the prior to 7 p.m. is, is a bit challenging. Um, when a lot of shift workers, you know, maybe leave at 5.30 and then, you know, with a 12-hour shift plus drive time wherever they work, um, you know, maybe 5, 5 p.m. would be more reasonable. It would still allow them some time before they leave if they're on a night shift to add that garbage out and then, um, yeah, and then a, a little bit more freedom with the pickup time, but uh, but not excessive. Um, and I have a couple other more questions as well. Um, so in there, is the town still uh, planning on doing their spring uh, curbside pickup of, of waste that they've done in the past? In Correct. reflection of this, it, it um, sounded like that it, it wouldn't be happening. Are you, uh, you're talking about like a spring clean the spring yeah. cleanup that we do yeah. after the, the week after the May long weekend every yeah. year. Yeah. That's still an in, okay. intent of it. That's um, and that's never been part of the of the bylaw. It was just always something that we have done, and that's just kind of its special circumstances where we allow okay. the residents to put everything out into the to the street to pick up. So it was just okay. kind of a separate program that's always been run. Okay, and then uh, one more Go question. Um, so I believe it is in um, six. F, it talks about the uh, waste containers must be one meter from everything and have three meters of space above it. Um, I know in some of our neighborhoods, uh, the trees are between the sidewalk and the curb and they're beautiful trees that have some overhanging branches. Um, do we know if any of those areas are gonna have a problem with um, the garbage pickup? No, Councilor Barr through the chair. Uh, we have talked to the contractor. If there is a, okay. the yeah, odd one that's going to happen, they will move the bins out. We don't foresee okay. there's going to be huge, huge okay. issues anywhere. And obviously with some of the program going, we're going to have some growing pains of mm -hmm. just meaning we'll have to move them one way or the other. Uh, but the contractor has no issues on the odd time in the beginning to be able to pull them out. And if we need to, then we'll use that opportunity to educate the public and be able to knock on the door and say, would you be able to move it one way or the other? Or can we accommodate you? Perfect. Thank you. I guess uh, I've got a question here in that. Uh, in the trade show, and there was questions and answers on this and here and that, I had a lot of questions saying that um, some of the people have mobility issues and can't get their, their containers down to the curb. And I read in here someplace where they said they would go up to the door and bring them down for them. Is 
that a policy they're going to follow? Because we could have a lot of people. You know, I can't see them stopping, getting up, walking up to the door, bringing them down for the people and taking them back. That could keep you get, you know, quite a long time doing that for their pickup and that get behind. That's something that, that they're going to do or whatever. I can answer that, Mr. Chair. So in talking with the contractor, basically what the resident has to do is get a hold of the contractor themselves, and they will then basically go and they will do kind of like a home interview, make sure that the person is eligible, find out where the bin is located, what they need it done, and then they will engage that services with that resident. They will obviously want to make sure that the, that the right people are using the program and the system is not being abused. Um, they've used it in the past other communities. The feedback we've had has been positive, and they have followed through in the past with that. Um, obviously, we'll have to see uh, who, who uses that or who engages the services of that and how that works for them. We'll probably have a few people like that. And I guess the other question was raised was, uh, if the bins get damaged in any way, shape, or form, they have to be replaced, whose cost is that? Uh, Mr. Chair, typically it'll depend if you obviously run over your bin and, and mangle it. It would be the homeowners, other than normal wear and tear, is taken care of by the contractor. They will bring out, they keep stock new wheels, uh, and that's usually typically the only thing that happens. Uh, if they drop it down too fast, if they squish out the lid, they have all those parts in stock that they will be taking care of that. And if they get stolen by any means and don't return, is that the cost of the resident or is that the cost of the contractor? Some of the, the stuff that we're hearing from them is they've got some extra bins that are uh, allocated within the program. They will be bringing some of the bins, to my knowledge, to free residents to the charges or sorry, free um, of charge to the residents. Typically what we've asked them to do is put your addresses on it. Yep. Uh, what they found in the past is it's usually somebody that's just moved the bin farther down. If you have the address of the house location onto it, they can make sure that that bin gets back to the proper location. Uh, typically they don't usually go missing, they just go down the street for a walk. Yeah. And I guess one other question too was, on, on top of the bins are, a lot of the bins, whether they're organic or whatever, and that have signage on them, what you can put inside and that. I know there's still quite a confusion of what can be put in the two different bins here and that. And uh, in the bins, we had a trade show, people were looking on the top, and uh, they weren't, weren't new bins, they brought out their old bins, and they were all scratched up off the top, but they were looking for a diagram of saying, okay, you can put, you know, raw cooked food in this one here and that, but to, you know, and they were looking for some kind of uh, clarity in that or what could go in, what you know, should not go in. Are they going to put any kind of a, a sticker on the top of their bin to help? people that way? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, and part of that was we had a, a cancellation at the last minute. So those actually the, the bins that we had seen at the trade show were actually brought in specifically for, for props for <laughs> to, to use with advertising. Uh, so that was just kind of a last minute thing, but the bins will be clearly labeled. Uh, they will have better ones on and they will continue to be doing through uh, Mr. Beschi our advertising program that will clearly tell everybody what's going into it for organics and the regular kitchen waste and, and what's available. Here's it here. Uh, yeah, so further through this uh, <clears throat> bylaw uh, on the recyclables collection, uh, if and when uh, council chooses to go that direction, um, I certainly would like, and I, maybe it's someplace else here in the bylaw, but um, uh, there's a few things I think that we need to include um, uh, within the bylaw um, that uh, the, the town or contractor has a refusal to accept. Um, has the right to refuse. Has the right to refuse items uh, within um, the recycling program if there's contaminants found. Um, one of the things that uh, Councillor Sorens and I uh, heard at our workshop that we went to, it's really important if we do have a curbside program to have audits in place to ensure contaminants are not going into our recycling stream. And I would like to see some teeth behind that. Um, that would give us the legal authority to say, this bin will not be collected this week because you have glass or you have uh, garbage within your, your recycling container uh, to help us with that education component. Um, I know that we had uh, received a recommendation from the uh, uh, Recycling Society about uh, possibly introducing a plastic bag ban uh, within our community. I know other communities are following that direction um, and a number of businesses are as well. Um, so I was wondering if any consideration was given to that before we adopt this bylaw. Um, and uh, I think those were, I think, the key, key points that I had. If I may, sure. Um, I, I think we'd be happy to consider the um, plastic bag ban, but I don't think we'd have time to incorporate it into this bylaw. We'd really like to get this bylaw passed, obviously, with the introduction of our new system. 
um, but uh, it's administration's intention to bring forward, I think, a number of um, uh, reports on some of those recommendations from the Recycling Society, at which time an amendment to the bylaw could easily be made to, uh, to accommodate that. Do you have something, Daniel? Yeah, sorry to jump in. I just wanted to add in regards to uh, not picking up bins or, or blue bags that have uh, contaminants in them. I think to some extent that would already be covered under 6.1G, where there's a requirement that residents only put acceptable materials as defined by the bylaw. And then uh, further on in 6.1K, it does indicate that the solid waste collector will, will, may not could collect bins or waste containers that are not compliant with, with 6.1 as a whole. Excellent. Thank you. I think on that part too, the, the bags got to be compostable bags that should be going in there, mm -hmm. not just a regular bag from that day. Uh, uh, Councillor Sorensen. Through this here, I'm not sure we need any re any mention of bags, and I'm not I don't understand the, the nece necessity to uh, specifically talk about bags, especially the cost of them. Uh, if we're going to pay for them, you know, because we. Uh, Many of these bins don't require bags. I, I think that's mostly in reference to the blue bag recycling program. Yeah. yeah. I still don't. We may go to a container system instead of a bag system, so I'm not sure the need to specify it in the bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, we can give some consideration to adjusting that language, I think. Sorry, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, give some consideration to adjusting that language to say that if it is a blue bag recycling program, then the residents would be required to purchase their own bags. But um, certainly we can, uh, I think, give some context to that because it, it may or may not be the system that we adopt for sure. Oh, that, that goes for just regular garbage in general. People have to pay for their own bags, so I don't know why we'd need to specify it for recycling. Any questions? Any other comments on the bylaw? <coughs> I guess I just got one comment in that. Uh, I know we want to bring this back on May the 1st here and that, but uh, I know we're, we're missing two councillors here and that. I would like to see us wait until these other two councillors be able to come back and have an input on it and, you know, hear what they have to say on it themselves, themselves and that. Um, I don't think we're in any hurry right now. Another week or so isn't going to make or break it in that. And I know that uh, we did receive an email asking that we defer it till uh, they get back. That and I, 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 I'd like to see that. I'd like to hear their input too, even though we know we're down two councils. Councilor Schnard obviously can't uh, be in our conversation, but I think the other two could. So I'd like to see us wait until they came back. Well, I, I think that uh, if, if I may, um, administration, it would be our intention to bring this back on May 1st, unless the table um, indicated to us that they didn't want us to. Uh, my my, uh, my uh, feel on some of the requests was more specific to the conversation on curbside recycling rather than the waste collection bylaw itself. It would be administration's strong preference to have this bylaw passed prior to the beginning of the waste collection program that we're planning on implementing. And so I, I, I think I would just, I think make a distinction between the conversation on curbside recycling and, and the passing of, of the bylaw. But I would need to have some pretty firm direction from the table to, to defer this. Um, I think in particular councillors are going to be absent at different points and holding pieces for councillors as they're away on various business becomes I think a little bit of a slippery slope or problematic and, and um, they're also welcome to submit any of their feedback via email or, or speaking to their fellow councillors to provide their perspectives as, as well but um, I don't know if the rest of council uh, shares that view or not. Did you end up Council Byer? Um, I did. So to address um, the question to the Chair to Administration, um, I, I, I know the Waste Management repeal, uh, Bylaw Repeal and Replace. Um, I, I think that it probably should be in place before we start our curbside uh, waste and organics program. Um, and uh, any input that uh, councillors that aren't present today, I, I think they've had the opportunity to address administration or fellow councillors um, on their thoughts on that. So um, I, I think maybe they've already been there their thoughts have been already um, uh, discussed, perhaps. Um, and uh, another question on the bylaw, um, I believe it is 10.6. Um, it says that there's only appropriate, if you um, have a violation ticket, that you only have seven consecutive business days to, or sorry, seven consecutive days 
from the date issue of the ticket um, uh, to not be liable for prosecution of the offense. Um, I was just wondering if seven days was a little bit too um, uh, strict of a timeline for someone that uh, you know made a mistake on it, so especially when you consider how long it takes to get mail and um, if people are you know are away for a few days, um, that you know innocently they can um, be you know. Unknown to you know, an offense or something. Yeah, I know. I think I understand. The context is is that enough time to reasonably yeah. deal with that situation? Yeah. No, we can give that some consideration okay. for sure. Councilor Sorensen. Uh, I, I agree with Councilor Baker's uh, comments. I'm, I'm ready to move forward on this. I think uh, all councilors have an op Well, I assume they have an opportunity to provide content to the uh, administration, and uh, I'd like to have this in place. <coughs> Chair. Um, yes, through the chair, I, I think that with the waste management bylaw, I think it's fairly important that we get this in place uh, for, for May 1st. Uh, uh, I know the concern was raised about the curbside recycling, and I think today we're uh, further in the agenda. We'll just have a discussion about that. Uh, I'm, I'm firmly against holding items uh, off the agenda because council or councillors or mayors can't attend. Um, you know, um, we all live busy lives, and following week somebody else may be gone and then the following week somebody else may be gone um, when these things hit the agenda there's opportunities for uh, input be brought, provided through email or uh, through us uh, directly uh, or through to administration so uh, it's important that we continue moving forward I wouldn't expect uh, anything to be left off the agenda if I was away um, I would expect council to to give due consideration as they do with everything so uh, I'm happy with with moving this forward uh, on the curbside recycling, uh, we'll have a discussion next on that, and, and maybe that'll be a little bit uh, different conversation. But uh, with this particular uh, bylaw, I think uh, we're fine to move forward for uh, the next council meeting. Thank you. Same, thank you. Any other comments on the bylaw itself? Good. So I think we can move forward to uh, next item, Mr. Chair. Yeah, if you can go to number two, two, curbside recycling. Yeah. <coughs> So small, you have to look at the closest TV. I'm, I'm, in the, I'm, in the, I'm right in the middle. I can't see either of them here, but that's kind of nice having one that I can look at instead of the little screen for a change. So, yeah. uh, obviously, at the February 13th committee meeting, uh, we had brought to uh, to council that we were going to go uh, or got their blessing to go ahead with a uh, survey that just basically shows the survey results um, that we had put out. So I think there was 800 and 882 882 respondents, which was phenomenal. Um, so it just shows the results that are up on, on to there. So it just shows basically uh, if they'd be willing to pay the extra. There was the two questions we had. Are willing to pay an extra 2 to $4 per month on your utility bill for biweekly curbside recycling services? And that just shows the results. If I may add to that. So I think at this point um, we have some pieces of information for council's consideration with curbside recycling. Um, we obviously have um, some feedback on the public will here, which seems to be um, you know, a, a pretty firm majority in favor of the concept of curbside recycling. Uh, we also have some significant variables to consider in terms of the um, uh, challenging marketplace for recyclable materials right now, which is a very, I think, important and real variable. Um, we have, uh, I think, some feedback from uh, our local recycling depot, which has added to this conversation as well. Um, administration's position now is, is simply that the public seem to be in favor of this type of service and now can we reasonably go forward and design a service that can address and navigate the existing challenges um, that are in the landscape most notably um, how do we deal with these materials in a sustainable and, and, and appropriate appropriate way um, our, our current contractor does have the ability to to do this um, in terms of picking up and, and uh, I, I think there's obviously some assurances that can and would need to be made in terms of uh, the disposal of those materials and what the end results are. 
I, I think it's also reasonable uh, to consider something like uh, an arrangement to be made for council to go and tour and visit their facility to see and, and understand it completely before engaging or making this type of determination. Um, uh, as well as uh, perhaps continued con consultation with the local recycling society as to how we can best design a, a program to uh, to meet this service level. Um, and uh, from a review of the uh, responses, um, there's, I, I think, certainly, as I said, a, a strong public interest in, in this, um, but uh, it, it must be designed in a way that is financially sustainable and environmentally responsible. Um, and I think we're um, asking council for some guidance as to uh, how they see this dynamic uh, moving forward. Thank you. Any questions? Councilor uh, Mayor Sahara, sorry. All right, so mm -hmm. this has been uh, a good topic of conversation in our community. I'm glad that we're having the conversation. I think it has raised awareness of recycling in general. Um, some of the challenges that we face as a community, as, as a nation in North America, uh, some of the great things that a recycling society uh, has done since since it was established uh, I don't think one could argue with with the success that a recycling society has provided our community um, I've had many conversations about this um, some people that are firmly against us moving to a curbside recycling program but many more that are, are certainly in favor um, the session that Councillor Sorensen and I went to uh, was very informative uh, in Sherwood Park on April 3rd. And one of the, one of the comments made, they had um, individuals there from the entire process, from the manufacturers to uh, the people that haul the uh, and collect uh, the recycling material to those that process it, uh, to those that create materials from recycled uh, products. And uh, one of the comments was made is that we built a house of cards with the single stream system and it's all coming crashing down because we've been false recycling for 30 years in many communities across North America where we put it into the blue bin and we forget about it, got hauled to China and it actually got either burnt up, buried, um, and it wasn't actually being recycled because it was so contaminated. Um, so with the Chinese sword policy, obviously it has uh, turned everything on its head um, the biggest change in 30 years and it's literally changing daily uh, with uh, lack of um, direction from our federal and provincial governments there's really a lot of chaos happening right now because every municipality is kind of doing something differently and uh, the plants don't know how to adjust because they don't know what they should be spending their money on to deal with these materials we also need producer responsibility uh, in our province and our provincial government has failed miserably both the past government and, and the current government, which I would expect would be all over this uh, to ensure that we have um, strong environmental policies. And they have yet to meet with the Recycling Association of Alberta, which uh, blows my mind. Uh, and also was very concerning that there was no provincial representation at the meeting that we went to. Um, so until those items get sorted out, um, we, we have a serious challenge in North America with with recycling materials just piling up and not being able to go to any markets or be used for anything. So uh, with that in mind, I think um, I think we need to take our time on this. Um, I'm, I'm firmly in favor of a curbside recycling program. I think our residents uh, have indicated that they wanted. Um, I see that it would be a benefit for our community, but we have to develop a program that makes sense, that ensures that we don't have contaminants that are going uh, into the stream and that the end product is that these materials are actually being recycled. So um, I would like to see us have something in place for 2019. Uh, in the meantime, tour the facility uh, and see if there's a way that we can develop a program that, that makes sense, that ensures that those materials are going to the, the right places. Um, as well as we will hopefully within six months have more information uh, from the industry itself in terms of how they're going to deal with with these new policies and we can have uh, 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 Be a leader actually in, in in a curbside recycling program in our community as we have been in the past with our recycling depot um, I, I've heard concerns from people that say well We have a depot system. Why would we want to change it? I don't want to use this service um, I don't believe that the contractor is going to deal with these materials in, a, in an appropriate manner. 
uh, when, when I hear those kind of comments, uh, one of the things that I, I would like to remind people is our recycling depot will still be there. We will still be investing in it. And if people feel that strongly, they, I certainly encourage them to continue to use the depot system uh, when, we, when we go to a curbside program. Uh, they play a huge role in our community. That's never going to change. Uh, but I do believe that we do need to, to develop a program that allows uh, for that convenience factor for our residents. So um, those are my initial thoughts. Um, I think between now and then we have some work to do uh, in terms of developing a program that makes sense. Uh, so uh, my, my thoughts after the charge administration is that, you know, I, uh, I echo a lot of what Mayor Zahara has commented. Um, uh, when I knew he, him and that Council Thompson were going to that meeting, I did um, uh, forward along my, my thoughts on the producer responsibility. I think that um, the government of Alberta, you know, needs to be taking a little bit of a, a forward step on that, and ho hopefully, you know, that can still happen. Um, and uh, I have, have, as well, spoke to many, many people that have been for or against uh, the curbside recycling, and um, and, and what Mayor Zahara has commented is that, uh, you know, we're, the, the depot isn't uh, going away. It's been a great, uh, tremendous asset to our community, and as uh, educated residents um, on, on recycling, and um, I, I think that if we can put a uh, very good, a strong plan in place as far as uh, education and um, if the con contamination rate is what is causing, uh, you know, some of the plastics, for instance, uh, to not be recycled, then we, we need to make sure that we have that uh, a, a very strong plan with that, uh, so we're not, um, uh, like Mayor Zahir said, not uh, just getting it burnt in China, uh, which is, you know, really, you know, un un unfortunate thing that has happened. Um, but I, on the other hand, I've talked to, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, families, especially that. Um, uh, really um, strongly want this program and uh, uh, although they you know, have been using most of them, um, some admitted that they don't recycle at all um, because they just don't have that kind of time uh, or space, but um, they, they strongly, really, really, really uh, are in favor of having a curbside recycling program. Dr. Shorts. Um, yes. Uh, Curbside recycling was part of my campaign, and so I am in full support of uh, curbside pickup. Um, clearly, the majority of our residents are, are in support of curbside pickup, and it would be a um, disservice to those uh, residents if we didn't implement it. Um, unfortunately, I believe the term curbside has been confused with single stream uh, mix and contaminated recycling, and I don't believe those two are synonymous. Uh, everyone educated on the issue uh, knows that the tonnage of material diverted from our landfill will increase with curbside pickup, and I believe that is the environmental metric that we need to use uh, to evaluate this program. Um, I would like to see us commit to curbside pickup, uh, but, um, but I would like to for us to work our way through our, our new changes in garbage collection. Uh, there's going to be a lot of issues with that, uh, so I don't think we need to uh, overlap the two issues at the same time. In a few months, once we've worked through the hiccups of that, then uh, um, I would like to see us work with the Edson and District Recycling Society to design a program for curbside pickup that minimizes contamination and uh, uh, those issues. Questions? Um, I, I thank you, Council Johnson. I, I would um, agree with your timeline. I, I think that working through the, uh, the current curbside waste and organics pickup um, and, and getting that kind of sorted out in everyone's mind is ideal. And then um, I, I, I would like to definitely work with the current the Edson and District Recycling Society to, um, to have a, a team effort. If, if I may try, so um, I, I think what I'm hearing in terms of feedback is development of curbside recycling program is we have the support of council to continue that process with obviously consideration to the variables that have uh, been discussed uh, in, in terms of the sustainability of the program and, and their environmental responsibility associated with it. Would that be fair? May, may I also just ask, uh, is, is there genuine interest in a tour of the contractor's facility? Is that something that council would find valuable as we go through that process? Mayor Zaire? 
Um, I think it would be beneficial to, to have a, a tour of the facility and, and for another opportunity to ask the contractor some questions. Um, I, I agree that um, we, we're going to have some hiccups with, with organics. There seems to be a lot of confusion of what that actually means. Um, um, and I, and I, I concur with um, Councillor Sorensen that I, I would like to see us make a firm commitment to a curbside program. Um, but I, I don't think we need to rush into it, and uh, I, I think that working with the Recycling Depot is, is, is the best source of moving us forward, so of course I'm moving us forward. I think that's enough feedback for administration, Darren, yes. you're comfortable with that, that we can keep this moving forward? No, and I also think, uh, you know, I'm still not 100% sold in this myself and that, but I know it's, it's probably going to end up going that way. Uh, I know our Recycling Depot down there is going to look different when this gets up and running, whoever does in that. But I think, you know, we take our time, like uh, Councilor Sorden said, you know, and get the one project off the ground here <clears throat> and then work at the other one. Let's not do two and one and miss something that we need to, to make sure that our residents and we understand ourselves in that and we get everything put in there on a one shot. And I think, Councilor Sorensen, you said on September 19th, we were at a meeting at the uh, Waste Management, there's a recycling. Uh, seminar conference going on in yeah. Jasper. Yeah. Do you have any uh, information on that? Or is it yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think uh, uh, this is obviously an important um, service level discussion and we appreciate <coughs> Council's feedback. I think we're in an advantageous position that we are um, aware of some of these challenges before designing our program compared to many of these communities who have implemented and designed programs that might not necessarily fit the future. Uh, and so I think we're actually in a favorable position to be able to deal with this as well as any municipality. And, and so we'll try and leverage that into obviously positive, positive outcomes. And, and I, I think administration firmly believes that curbside recycling is the right mechanism. Um, but um, the caveat being it must be well designed and it must be done responsibly. Councilor Barr. Uh, through the chair to administration, um, can we um, make sure that the uh, the survey results here on the screen um, just get emailed to the other councillors that aren't here right now? Yeah, and, and we will also be making this public now. We just want to report to council course, before yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so now we will uh, obviously release these results publicly as well. So thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay then. Good. Moving on to uh, protective service oh, staff wait, report. Do you have yeah. Oh, yeah we're going also, if I just may remind council that um, obviously uh, um, we are scheduled to engage the county here. Um, at noon is what we've set for, but ahead of that would obviously I think be positive. So um, uh, not the, not that I would ask that you don't give it appropriate consideration, but just to be mindful of that. And we can also carry over any conversation uh, as well if we feel like that timeline is uh, is getting tight. Um, I think I, I think it would be great if we could be closer to 11.30, 11.45, so just uh, uh, for the chair to consider. So and we do have the in-camera item that I think yeah. needs to yeah. be that, that, that should just be brief, but... Brief, um, yeah. Yeah. Talk fast, Al. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all appeased. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for the opportunity to come here. Unfortunately, my, my partner in crime couldn't be here to help with this presentation, and a lot of it does relate to planning and development, but... We've been working well closely together on this uh, presentation, so I'm hopefully going to have all the answers for you. And we'll just kind of move into this. Um, like everybody knows, uh, the legalization of cannabis is coming. Uh, the federal government had made that decision uh, quite some time ago, and they were targeting this summer. Originally, they had the uh, July 1st time frame. Well, obviously, that's been pushed back. They really haven't solidified a time frame now from the federal government side, which is fine. Um, and some of the things that they have laid out down to the provinces to start creating the provincial framework. Uh, on the provincial framework side, uh, the province department that's looking after it is the AGLC, which is the Alberta Gaming and Liquor Control Board. They will be looking after this. And they've already made some really key decisions on that. The cannabis cannot be sold in relation with alcohol, uh, so they don't want it in the liquor stores. Pharmaceuticals, right, so they can't be sold in our local drug stores, and tobacco. Those are some of the key things that the province has said right up front that they're not going to be allowed. Uh, so that's minimum requirements that the province has put on for cannabis stores is some very minimum uh, restrictions that, number one, they can't be 100 meters. They have to be a minimum of 100 meters from any provincial health care system, facility, uh, schools, and municipal and school reserve lands. So those are 
guidelines that the province has already laid out to the municipalities that you we have to meet those those guidelines to begin with. So what are the municipalities responsible for? Uh, there's three key areas that the province has put the responsibility back on the municipalities when it comes to the legalization of cannabis. Number one is making sure that we have an approved development permit and that's going to be designed through our land use framework and that's the key. We'll talk quite a bit about that coming up. Uh, they also say uh, the municipality is responsible for issuing business licenses, which the municipality of Edson does. But some municipalities out there don't have business license systems, so they have to still give a written approval that they're going to allow those, those stores. And the final thing was fire approval, so uh, which is the right to occupy those buildings and make sure they're, they're meeting the current fire standards and fire codes. So those are the three things that the municipality, as we move forward with this framework, that we have to take into consideration that we are responsible for. Land use, that's the biggest um, thing that we need to sort out as a group, as an organization, as to what we want. What we're proposing um, for our land use side is where we want these cannabis store locations to be is really in our, in our C1 retail commercial and in our C3 service commercial. And we also want to have the ability to keep them as a discretionary. What the discretionary status does in these land use is gives our development authority, which is our development officer, some powers to make to grant or refuse and based on different criteria. And some of the criteria are the, the parking issues, traffic issues, or other compliance with other legislation. It gives that development office some flexibility to make that decision on a discretionary basis. And that's really where we want to go with this. I think to add, if I may, I'll to add Absolutely. to that, the discretionary use is also important because as soon as it make, makes uh, becomes a permitted use, we must allow it as long as it meets the criteria where the discretion allows for review of certain um, elements that I'll describe there. It gives us some leeway. That's right. It does. It's a flexibility. Flexibility, yeah. So that's for cannabis stores. <clears throat> this is a map which kind of shows those areas. The pink is your retail commercial and the yellow is your service commercial. So this is where we envision uh, any cannabis stores coming into our community being set up and proposed to be set up. I just wanted to shoot, give you that snapshot. We really want to keep them out of the residential areas and obviously away from schools because we're legislated to do that. The other area, other than the retail stores, which has come to light, and we've done some research with other communities, is uh, cannabis counseling and cannabis growing facilities. We thought we'd take the opportunity as, as we work through our land use bylaw, which is going to be updated this year, is identify these. And these the other two items have been uh, earmarked in the bigger centers as potential um, pinch points and areas that we want to make sure that we're covering. So for growing facilities, and we have none in our community applications or no one any interest, but let's cover it right now. Uh, <coughs> our development authority see those as being in your industrial areas. And again, under discretionary to make sure that they're gonna fit to where they belong. And on the counseling, again, C1 retail and C3 service commercial and under the discretionary for the same reasons that we've talked about, right? Traffic, parking, the, the flow of people. Counseling is something new that's come up. The City of Calgary has identified it. They've had inquiries. And when we look at that, we've actually had inquiries already about setting up cannabis counseling centers in our community. What that means, really, we're not sure. Um, when people are approaching us, you know, it was originally a group that we're going to get into the retail. Now that same group has shifted and we're not going to do retail, we're going to do can cannabis counseling. So sometimes those are, you know, kind of things that, okay, what does it really mean? We don't have a good handle on that, but we're going to address it in our land use, and again, keeping them in the discretionary, keeping them in these retail commercial, service commercial specifically. Under, for facilities, again, this is our industrial land base. Under the discretionary, we can look at this, and we can obviously know there's some areas on this where we probably wouldn't want a grow facility. Uh, having that ability for a development officer to have the discretion and push them out to the outskirts and stuff within their community. Just give you an idea as to what land uses we're talking about. Separation distances, and this is kind of the area where we wanted to get into some discussion, is provincially, the bare minimum we have to provide as municipalities is 100 meters from provincial healthcare facilities, schools, and municipal lands that are designated to that. However, through our land use framework, we have the ability to consider creating more distances, and the bigger centers have done this. Uh, Edmonton, for example, are considering a 200 meter separation between other cannabis stores, other liquor stores, and some other facilities. Uh, Calgary's looking at 150 meter, 
Red, you're looking at a 300 meter. The biggest reason for these, for those bigger centers, is they want to eliminate what's known as clustering. For example, downtown Edmonton, and especially with the liquor store they applied, and they're applying the same for the cannabis, they don't want 10 liquor stores, 10 cannabis stores in a two block area in the downtown area of Edmonton. That was the reasoning behind their approach. When we talked to some of the smaller centers, they're kind of going with the provincial minimum of 100 meters. Um, but again, that's a discussion that we, we, we should have at this table as to what is the feel from our community? Do we need to follow just the minimum or do we want to add more? And our opportunity is now because we are reviewing our, our land use bylaw. So I'll open that question back up to council for feedback. Any questions? Councillor Sorensen and Councillor Chouinard. Uh, through the chair, thank you for the presentation. Uh, can you educate me on what uh, options we have if we um, if we give a business license to someone now and then the provincial standards change? Do we have any op Is there any opportunity to move someone after they're already established? Yeah. So uh, all of our development permits are issued with the requirement that establishments follow all federal and provincial legislation. So it does give us the ability to uh, to address that. I think that would be a challenge if there's an existing business there, and I, I, I don't think we could confidently comment on exactly what that looks like, but if provincial or federal regulations change, development permits do require that they follow those rules. The challenge is if, if it's a change in physical proximity and their store or their place of business is already existing, uh, we would have to decide whether or not we would uh, uh, allow it to remain kind of until, you know, it, lives its natural life and then we just wouldn't renew a development permit or what course of action we would take but mm -hmm. there is that mechanism generally in place to deal with that although I, I think it would be fair to suggest that will be challenging uh, through the chair uh, actually thanks Al for doing the work this has been a hot topic and lots for everyone a lot of times rule of thumb is kind of like if you follow virtually liquor stores and uh, tobacco rules so I'm seeing like that but I totally agree the distance uh, is something we can consider like a lot of times it's valuable but I mean the information is uh, thank you for doing the work and we already have two in town so we have to move Not legally. <laughs> well we have, we have zero in we town have zero in town okay and if I could talk to that there's been that misconception um, and my office has been really flooded with inquiries from a lot of interested people opening up until this legislation is done anybody who is operating is operating illegally. City of Edmonton did a crackdown earlier this year because they had a lot of uh, facilities that were up and running selling cannabis. City of Edmonton police went in and charged a lot of those store owners with trafficking. Uh, that is before the courts right now um, because they were they were moving, they were selling cannabis illegally. It is trafficking. Until this is done, anybody selling cannabis is still trafficking. If I may add to Councillor Schwartzen's question, as I think about this, I, I, I generally think a rule that uh, is easier to apply is if you start with firmer guidelines it's easier to back down but if you start with loose guidelines it can become really difficult to tighten them up and so if council was to have that concern my suggestion would be start firmer and if that creates problems it's easier to to back down on a distance requirement for example rather than to start at a minimum level and then find out that you actually prefer more distance then it creates those challenges that you described of existing facilities and, and that type of dynamic. But. Councilor Byer, then Mayor Sahar. Uh, so I, I know we've all been uh, quite uh, interested in this in, entire process with all the different conferences and everything we've attended. Um, it's definitely a hot topic. Um, I, I, you know, on, on looking at all this, I think that um, yeah, a lot of municipalities can have, you know, if every municipality has a different rule, it, it is really hard to, I think, um, when you have people visiting or, or moving around to try to enforce that. And, and I think following something like the, what the cities have been doing, um, you know, Edmonton, you know, maybe it, because it's closer to us in proximity, um, following what their uh, standard is might be easier. Uh, perhaps, you know, if I'm wrong, please let me know um, as far as enforcement goes. Um, uh, you know, if people you know go to the city or something, then the, the rules would be similar there. And then if people are coming back this way to visit family or whatever that might look like, um, that they're a, a little bit more consistent um, as far as even usage goes. Um, I, I know that's not what is thought there right now, but um, that's kind of how I see it. And then what uh, CAO Derek Hot had mentioned as well is, um, I think it might be easier to 
uh, be a little strict to begin with and, and, and go a little lenient if that seems necessary. But if we start lenient and, and, and go stricter, it, it's, a ch I think, a challenge to, um, to make those types of changes. Mayor Zahir. Uh, yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor Bevan. Uh, through to administration, I think I agree with uh, CEO Derricott that we need to start stricter. Um, I think one of the things as we're having the conversation about cannabis is I don't think the public realizes the loop, the, the, the hoops that um, these stores need to go through to get approved. Um, at being at the uh, Leaders Caucus in Edmonton, I talked to an uh, individual that I've worked with previously. He's representing a company that does retail cannabis and the amount of money they need to spend in order to make their facility meet the guidelines of the provincial legislation is astronomical. So Joe Blow citizen thinks that they're going to open up a pot store. It ain't happening. Um, and I think that's a common misconception across uh, the country right now. They don't understand the, the rules, especially in Alberta, where um, I think Alberta is being seen as a leader of doing this right um, and dealing with this. So uh, starting stricter, uh, I think, is good. Um, I do have a question because it's not in here. Maybe I missed it. Um, how are we going to deal with uh, people consuming uh, cannabis on streets. Um, I think Calgary has moved to go to an outright ban in public areas. Um, wondering uh, what work has been done on that. I, I think that's probably uh, one of our bigger concerns at, at, at this point from a public standpoint. Just, just before we maybe move on to that, would, would it be safe to say, I, I think there's some value in using Edmonton as a guide right now because our media, uh, you know, the both print media and news media will be talking about this a lot and if our guidelines were to generally match up with the city of Edmonton to begin I think there's probably some benefit to that in terms of the distance I'm talking about so if we were to move forward administratively saying we're going to kind of use that 200 meters that Edmonton is considering as as our guide at this point in the process would that be I think fair I think so from my perspective. and then I'll allow out to I think because he's going to deal yep. with um, that uh, question the mayor yeah. had as well yeah, so. and that was again through the chair, one of the big things that we're looking for on the, on the land use side is, is to get that sense as to what the distance you wanted between cannabis stores and do we apply that between cannabis and liquor stores. So those are the two big questions that we had moving forward. Um, again, I know the bigger cities have clustering problems. I don't see that as, as big as of an issue, but I agree this is an opportunity to add some restrictions to it and then relax them. So I guess just want to get a feel, do we want to apply that 200 meters to just cannabis store to cannabis store or cannabis store to liquor store as well? Councilor Shorts, you had a question. I have a... a we'll question. have to think on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see uh, setbacks from parks, um, for sure, and green spaces. And I, I do have some concerns that a, a, a lot of first, second, third, and fourth as are not uh, zoned commercial, and I think it would be totally appropriate uh, for this type of activity. Um, and likewise, um, some of the area between 40th and 63rd that is zoned uh, industrial or light industrial, I would not want to see a grow operation with between those mm -hmm. that range. Um, uh, and I would, even if it is zoned commercial, I wouldn't want it backing onto the residential, so some of 4th Ave backs right onto 5th Ave's residential areas, so I think adjacency is an issue. And lastly, uh, from um, AUMA uh, conferences, we heard that odor and air filtration is another major issue. Some of these, uh, that some municipalities didn't consider the, the, the odor issues from some of these locations. So. Uh, we, I would like to have that as an opportunity for review during the development process. Yeah, and th I think then those are the things you can address as a discretionary use. You can have some of those considerations added in there. So that's that's uh, positive feedback. Thank you. Councilor Schneider. Uh, um, through the chair to Al, just where we talked about the actual consumption, I guess, was the question. The question was asked when we were at Brown Brown Lee, our annual training stuff in February. A lot of times, where I brought, if you apply it to alcohol, so if alcohol is not allowed in pri in virtually public spaces, then we can kind of mirror that. So if I can't have a beer in the park, well, I surely cannot consume alcohol there. That's sort of a rule that we can follow. 
that I believe would, would be, while we're talking about this, maybe work on a bylaw for consumption. I think, yeah. if, you, I think if you want to move forward, you have a few more. I just got yeah. a couple more slides here. Yeah. Okay. Dealing with the um, consumption. Oh, sorry. I jumped Not dealing with the consumption, oh. but dealing with the approval process. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, just to wrap up, I got a really good sense back from the land use framework side as to what we can do, and that's great. And I did, I did put the question about alcohol to cannabis. Give us some thought and give us your feedback at another time, which is fine. Uh, just to quickly wrap up, uh, the other thing is the fire approval. What that means for the fire department to go in there and do their thing, they will not do any approvals until the development permit has been approved from our planning, and they won't go in until AGLC has been approved. Then our fire department will go in and do their inspections. So there's no sense going in there ahead of time until these they met that criteria. Uh, same as the business license, uh, working together with all our groups. Uh, again, before we issue a business license, we're going to ensure that the development permit has been issued, that the fire approval has been issued, and that the AGLC approval has been issued. Uh, business license is the big one where we've been getting inquiries about over the last three months, people coming in and actually paying for and applying for business licenses, and we've rejected them and sent them back to them. Uh, and But moving forward, people will have to have these three things in place prior to any business license being issued. And then again, some of the things that we just want to do, and this is all with our next steps, is to, um, once we develop our land use framework, again, advertise opportunity for public feedback, possibly a public hearing, then in the fall, do the actual land use bylaw amendments. You know, and I like that. I like to have, have a public feedback on that too. I think it's important that our residents have a uh, uh, say on it, because yep. they're gonna have a say where they want it, where they don't want it. I know it's going to be some not in my backyard and that, but I know this has been a big topic and I've heard a lot of people saying that, like we have a, a rotary in the park and that and they allow smoking in there. They say, you know, they don't want the smoking in there, they don't want the cannabis in there either and that. So I think that's something we got to look at, uh, you know, saying uh, neither will be allowed in our parks where we have our young children and stuff like this and that. And we have uh, our large number of people that come down there and some are arm breathing machines or stuff like that, you know, and they don't need to, to smell this or whatever and that. So I think we got a lot to talk about in here, you know, and that's where we want to go. I like the idea that, you know, we go higher. We can always scale her back if we have to. Well, you know, <laughs> higher or not. <laughs> <laughs> so Deputy Mayor uh, Bevan with the first uh, marijuana yeah. joke. Nice. Yeah, yeah, there we go. I, I was born in the 50s, raised the 60s. So, yeah. so there we go. We started it, so. But yeah, so. And, and if I can make one final comment, on the consumption side of it, there is work being done provincially to uh, see how they're going to deal with this on the enforcement side. Uh, are they going to treat it the same as alcohol, open, some op open consumption in vehicles, in parks, and all that? We don't know that right now. The City of Calgary was very proactive and took the approach and created a bylaw which outright uh, bans the smoking of cannabis in, in all those areas, even on public streets, I believe. Uh, and that was a very bold move on them and a very forward thinking. Uh, but for us, we've, we've wanted to get this framework in place because the minute the province starts releasing the approved licenses, they're going to be knocking on our door to start setting up shop. Um, and we want to make sure that from the retail side that we're ready. Our next step is to look <coughs> at the consumption side and how that actually falls into place. And I guess it's going to be a review, I think, of our smoking bylaw and tying cannabis into that as well. So that's those are reviews that are... It, it, it's due for us to review those any, as well because they don't deal with things like e-cigarettes or vaping either and we need to incorporate that into those bylaws as well. Mayor Zahir? Um, yes, through the chair. I know the ADLC has published uh, a list of which municipalities had applications for facilities and Edson has yet to be included on that list so I think we've got some time hopefully. Um, on that, uh, my only comment would be that uh, I believe that we should, and I've heard from some bar owners in, in our community that uh, they believe that we should outright ban um, public smoking of cannabis on our streets um, if they don't want it in front of their buildings, uh, mm -hmm. especially with consumption of alcohol and that sort of things and, and the impacts that could have. Uh, certainly not in parks, um, and uh, so that would be the feedback I'd give. Uh, as you're as you're working uh, towards that, of course, we can go through the public consultation phase and see what what people say. But those are my initial thoughts. I guess the other question I got for you all is um, our bylaw officers and that their CPO one CPO twos right now. We change the designation to CPO ones. They have more enforcement. Uh, pretty well, much is the same as the RCMP. Have. What kind of effect are they going to have 
you know, of um, trying to enforce a law that we may have to get the RCMP involved or whatever and that, but if they were change their from two to ones, they would be able to issue the tickets, they'd be able to issue all these traffic, whatever and that, as, a, as the RCMP would be able to do. I think when any designation that you want to have your officers to have, whether it's a CPO 2, CPO 1, you apply to the sole gen, and there's a whole raft of different legislations that, that as a municipality we can decide that we want to enforce. Right now we enforce provincial procedures which deals with the finding part and traffic non-moving violations. Um, but that's not to say we can't look at a whole lot of other legislation that we want our officers to do. Uh, that's a level of service and a decision that we have to make. Whatever we decide, it'll be working closely with the RCMP moving forward on any of those things. And there's a lot. There's dangerous dogs, trespassing, um, just to name a few, moving violation, smoking. There, there's, a, there's a real lot of them that, as a municipality, we can decide to enforce if we so, so do choose. And that'll be a discussion that I'll have with the Dutchman Cander uh, Staff King is to see where the benefits he sees to help support his officers with our officers and working together to tackle some of those projects with. I'd like to see us have that discussion and that, and if we have to, you know, send them off with the training and move them from yeah. level two to level one, I think it may, you know, benefit us in the long run here and maybe get rid of some of the, the headaches we may have. So I'd like to see we have a discussion on that also. On that. Councilor Soros. Um, as, as far as setback distances to go, I'm not really um, too in support of long, long, larger distances. Edmonton has a lot of land area to play with. We're a relatively small town. If you start going 100 meters away from a liquor store and 100 meters away from a park, there's not much left <laughs> for this town. Um, but uh, I would uh, like to s explore any opportunity we can to maybe put... Um, make them temporary development permits or something where there's a time frame saying we're going to reevaluate this in three to five years or something and I don't know if there's, there's an opportunity to do that with any kind of uh, uh, but give give them a heads up right from the start that things are changing right now and three years from now we may that may not be an appropriate location for a thanks for the feedback well, don't Good we on. have that in our bylaw that if we need to cancel a business license, we can cancel it for certain, uh, uh, let me say, restrictions on it and everything else. They're not meeting what this should be. I, 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 we definitely have some mechanisms in place uh, and temporary permitting, if it's a discretionary, discretionary use, is possible. I think you just run into the fact then that once it's there, even if you say we're not going to permit it anymore, it's just more difficult to have it yeah. move. It, not that it can't be done. I think what we would find helpful is, as one of the provincial regulations, they would be required to have a, a approved development permit. And if we were to contact the province and say, X retail outlet does not have an approved development permit, things would get pretty uncomfortable for them pretty quickly. Um, and so I think we'll have that ability to address that. But, so that's really good feedback. I think that will help Al and Anne as they kind of <laughs> keep working on this. So, but. Okay, thanks Al. Thanks. Okay, moving on, it's getting late here to information items, amend and refine West Area Structure Plan. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. That was just for Council's information. I know the West End has been um, under consideration for development for a long, long time, and um, this is just a piece of the process that would allow us to give some context to potential developers in that area. Not asking for any additional budget, it would be covered under the uh, existing budget. Mm -hmm. so any questions? Go ahead. Um, we have a, my, through the chair, um, my only concern is we have a lot on our plate this year and I'm worried about administrators' time to take on a new uh, structure plan or yeah. time commitment. Or yeah, thank you. It, it will be contracted out for the most part and so I, I think we're comfortable to be able to address that, but yes, thanks for the, for the consideration. I guess I can comment on that too. Uh, the last council here, we went around and around and around and it's a lot and we had, uh, a lot of input from the citizens out there, the landowners out there and everything else. And uh, we still have some work we have to do on it. So it's gonna take a little bit of time here too, but uh, they're always welcome to come in and talk to administration or whatever and that, uh, so the door's always open. Yeah, and certainly as part of any area structure plan, consultation with the landowners will be a significant part of the process. So. Okay, Councilor Byer. 
Um, yeah, I, th I think that it's something that's necessary to, to move forward. And the earlier that we do it, you know, delaying it, you know, another five years or ten years or whatever that might look like, only makes it more challenging for the current landowners. Um, and uh, I, I think that it's, you know, it, as uh, Deputy Mayor Bevan suggested as well, that um, we would certainly welcome the feedback from the landowners out there as well. Thank you. I think on that one too, that if when we looked at this area of structure plan, if we had. Uh, businesses knocking on our door to want to be in here, we would have done it sooner. But unfortunately with the downturn in the economy and we didn't have a lot of industry wanting to come in here and set up shops, so we've just been moving along slowly at it and trying to get it raised. That we want to be prepared so we don't miss any opportunity is exactly. the key, key element there. So. Okay, no other questions? Okay, moving on, no sundry items. Questions from media and public regarding items. Ms. Quindle. Yes, please, through the chair, it's Mike. Um, you, this is the garbage, the garbage collection. <coughs> UK's had this system for probably about 30 years. Uh, moving from, first of all, a weekly collection to a bi-weekly collection, when it comes to your organic bins, have you thought anything about cleaning? Because they stink, and then as I they stink, they attract. Sure. Um, yep, certainly we're generally aware of those um, circumstances as we've talked uh, at length with other municipalities in the area who collect organic, Stony Plain and Bruce Grove and others, and um, we'll try to offer residents as much feedback, um, you know, lining with newspaper, use of organic bags, there's all kinds of kind of uh, factors. I just wonder because there, but in particular there's Thank you. Uh, um, we're not anticipating any significant a animal a activity, but I think that that's something that we will have to address if it becomes a challenge. Yeah. Okay. But I think too, it's really important as part of our education component that uh, making sure the lids are closed, uh, sealed properly. Uh, I know that um, in talking with some municipalities, that's sometimes an issue where the lids are not sealed, and then of course the animals are attracted. So. Yeah, yeah and if you've got an organic bin full of organic material that's there for two weeks in 40 degrees. Yeah, in the summer time, and that's one of the reasons why in the summer times we are picking up organics weekly to so try and mitigate that. Time. Yeah, and in winter it will be every two weeks, but okay. uh, theoretically with the cold it's less of an issue. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a question to do with needle pickups. Um, does the town do any sweeps to collect needles? If not, why yeah. not? If I may, yes, we absolutely have our staff doing regular sweeps of our parks and disposing of any obviously just general debris but in particular looking for any um, uh, needles and, and we have protocols in place to address and deal with that absolutely okay thank you very much any other questions yeah. louise Hi, louise Connolly. i'm a downtown business owner owner as well as uh, a member of the recycle um one thing is um uh, mayor zahara brought up the uh the concept about um, banning plastic bags. As a retailer who uses plastic bags, I have no problem with that. However, I ask that when you, you did, do decide to do that, that you give us a minimum of six months notice on it because we buy in bulk. And uh, if you start banning my bags, I'm gonna cause a real problem because all of a sudden I'm gonna have to dispose of something that you didn't want to be disposed of. <laughs> So I'm saying at least six months, if not a year. Uh, the other thing is, is with the, uh, the collection of uh, recyclables uh, at the curbside, I'm glad to see it being put off for at least another year. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot more discussion in what's going on with this. Uh, one thing, when we talk about the cost of doing it, I think sometimes we forget that if we uh, have the contractor cherry picking the items and that's what he's doing. He's picking the stuff that will bring him money. That is going to be an income source that the recycle board will not be able to use to manage the facility. So in the long run, the town and the county will be picking up that shortfall through that because right now things such as uh, the cardboard, uh, the um, uh, high grade paper and all of that 
Anne manages it quite well, and I jokingly call it, she plays the stock market, but it's the garbage one instead, and uh, knows directly where to send this to get the best value. So I think when you're looking at when your costs are involved, you have to look into the end that you're gonna be paying for it twice. You're gonna be paying for somebody to pick it up, and then you're gonna be paying a recycle with the cost of them not having that income stream coming in. So there will be a shortfall coming at the uh, recycle depot that will need to be met some way. Just, I'm, I'm saying take your time, and if you decide to go with the curbside pickup, then please involve the society with that because they are the, uh, the experts on it. And, uh, and when I'm talking to society, I'm talking more Anne because she's involved with it directly. And um, when you do make a tour to the uh, uh, to the gentleman's uh, facility, I suggest that you bring her along as well because she has the right questions to ask that quite often we as, as the generalists don't really understand. And uh, I think she could uh, help solve some of the problems that could happen if you go to curbside recycling. If I just can make one comment, yes. I know that uh, uh, at our presentation, uh, basically all the markets have dried up right now. Yeah. Even cardboard you can't make money on. And I think that's something I, I forgot to mention. Um, the cost of recycling in North America is going up, regardless of what we do or yeah. anybody does, just because of the situation we are in with China. And unfortunately, up until this point, nobody wants to pay for it. But um, I, th I, I certainly uh, hear your concerns there about, you know, removing revenue streams and that sort of thing, but I think we're gonna have some increased costs regardless if we introduce curbside or not. But we need to be aware of. that where she is sending it to, we are being paid for some of this product. Yeah. Um, and I know, because uh, I know with, within the last month or so, a couple items that it would normally have cost us to be sent um, was able to be sent with other deliveries because of the fact that they are so clean in the, in, in the concept because of the fact that Everybody who delivers product there sources it into the right bins 99% of the time. And I'll just comment on your 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 plastic bags too. That um, I know the food bank uses a lot of them. They double bag all their bags for every one that comes in there. And I know at our house and that we have double bag probably a thousand, two thousand bags, and they're collected and double bag and take them down there. And the people that come here and use so. Uh, if this is to go away, then they have to look at something else, which may be a cost to them, which also is not good for the people that are using the food bank. So there's a lot we kind of have to discuss in that. So uh, thank you for your input in that. Any other questions? No? Okay. Seeing none. Are we going in camera? Will I have a motion to move in camera, please? Motion to move in camera. All in favor? Okay.
and, uh, like we're ready to turn it back on. Okay. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, let me know when I can make a motion. Okay. Good to go. Are you looking for a motion to adjourn? Can we open that door? Yeah, I think, I think he's just going to let us know. Steve said yeah. Yeah. Good to go. Yeah. So, motion to adjourn. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Three people are like, you're welcome. You've got to have that signature line, right? Okay, I got 15 Walter Concrete. Yeah. Okay, we're